Hello and welcome to the last race of the World Cup 2022. We are back in the Swiss Alps in Davos for the long distance race today. We'll focus on the women first and then the men over the next four hours or so. And we've already had lots of people make their way around this very long, very, very grueling course. The overall World Cup for the women and the men has already been decided with our last starter Tova Alexanderson taking that her eighth overall World Cup title so great stuff for her and we'll see her very start very very shortly the conditions actually we've been watching uh, pictures from the start over the last uh, few minutes or so and and it goes very very quickly from quite bright sunshine to fog and mist and not really being able to see very much they've taken a, a cable car up to the top of the mountain to um make the the starting point and the conditions are I think quite changeable um, up there, up in the mountains, a little bit sunnier and uh, kind of a bit warmer down here at the finish. And um, we've got a, quite some crowd of people to welcome them in, though that they had to check in earlier in quarantine uh, at the bottom of the mountain before getting that cable car up and a lot of the teams um, making their way in. You can see Lena Strand there. She's one of the last starters. The start list today is in order of the World Cup. Uh, points. So uh, Lena Strand is third in the World Cup. Simone Abersold, who you can see there, she had a bit of a tricky race yesterday. A couple of minutes time loss right at the end. Uh, put her down into fifth place. So she, but she is second overall in the World Cup standings. You can see all sorts of uh, interesting and innovative um, warming up uh, choices for the the athletes hero. Even saw Casper Fosser just going for a little jog this morning from uh, from our accommodation. <laughs> so it's a whole kind of day's feat to prepare yourself for the what is to come, the long distance. Most people will have had these two races in their legs already. Some people, of course, didn't run uh, the relay like Tova Alexanderson, the last starter. Uh, estimated winning time today, 80 minutes on this 10.4K uh, course. Loads of climb, though, as well. Let's have a look at what um, is in store for the women today. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it before, they took the cable car up to the start, so we start high up the mountain again. It's this the typical alpine terrain as we had it at the relay in the beginning of the course. So we have this, often you have it that you have two or three controls in a kind of a nest and then a longer control to the next kind of nest of control. So we have this part here in the beginning and then from eight to nine, it's uh, the first long leg uh, with a route choice there. Either you go to the east or to the west. So either you go down from the control or you climb up to the street. At control 10 then, we will have the first TV control. So after about half an hour as it seems at the moment. These are a few pictures from the terrain there. You see the runnability in that part is quite okay. But um, yeah, it's always in the slope. It can make it quite difficult to run and it can get bushy. And then 11, 12, another route choice. My guess is that you have to run all the way around uh, in order to be fast there. Then you, there's a change in terrain from control 14. We leave this slope kind of orienteering and go into a more technical orienteering as we had it yesterday. So it's here, it's a, it's more like a middle distance characteristics for this long distance in this second part. You have the second TV control at number 18, you see it here. On the map, it looks really good and it looks like yesterday, the runnability. But when you're out there, there's a lot of vegetation on the ground, some uh, wood there as well. So runnability in this part, section 15 to 19 is not, not perfect. Then we change into the forest where we were yesterday. Uh, they, we have to do, or we, they have to do that uphill again from 21 to 22, the same uphill as they did yesterday. So now this is this exactly the same part uh, like yesterday. So the runners, they are familiar, familiar with that kind of terrain. It's more, uh, if we look back to yesterday, it's more stone in this, this section. And there we also have the third TV control. Then today, we will also have an arena passage, or kind of an arena passage, a last loop here. 
Um, you will see the arena on the west, uh, the west side of this Control 25. So it's a short loop in the very end, 26, 27, 28, 29, and then back to the finish. Yeah, so that's the main overview of the course for the women. Uh, and make note of all those kind of TV controls which you'll see. Here's the start list. So the order, um, especially for the later starters, will be that of the World Cup points. So as I said, World Cup leader Tova Alexanderson not there. No, um, so right at the start, no Venahayu today. Um, I think she has had some illness, the European uh, long distance champion and was third in the standings, I think, on the World Cup. Uh, she is not there, but we do have a lot of these other starters. Um, and obviously, I've mentioned Tova Alexanderson already. She's bound to be the, the favourite for today's race. She absolutely loves um, the mountain terrain. And we could see yesterday that her speed was incredibly high. Um, who else could we be looking out for to make an impact? I mean, we have often seen this fight between Simona Persold and Tova Alexanderson. I expect it to be a fight today as well. Maybe with some advantage for Tova Alexanderson, because often when it's a very physical race, uh, she She's performing very, very well. But also, we, I mean, we have other runners as well. Uh, Andrine Benjaminsen ran good yesterday. Uh, and then if we look back a few years, last time we have a long distance here in Switzerland in Alpine terrain, 2017 in Grindelwald. We had Elena Roos as the winner of the long distance. So she likes that kind of terrain and maybe she can perform well today as well. Yes, yeah, so you just saw a picture of her there, Maya Sienaya from Finland is the um, current leader. But we will look back at the start and you just mentioned her. This is Elena Ross just getting her competition underway. But our current leading time is one hour, 30 minutes and 45 seconds from Maya Sienaya of Finland. We're expecting um, Katrin Müller, I think, uh, in fairly shortly. She, she looks like she's been having a, a fairly good time out there too. But um, Eleanor Ross will disappear off uh, into the distance. And you could see it there in the picture when we saw Elena Ross running. It's a bit foggy. You mentioned that before. And um, it's not that dense yet, but if it gets more dense, it can really have an effect on the orienteering gear. Maybe it's not that powerful today it would have been worse in the relay because when you have these short controls it's often not a big deal um, but if you have longer legs in open terrain then it can be, uh, affect uh, the route choices and the orienteering you can see here uh, one of the routes possible routes you could also go all the way down but of course if you keep there close you can save some climbing there's also another possible route to go more to the west go around this out-of-bounds area there on the left side in this picture and approach the control from above. But here is Anielava, the Finn, then, to the TV control uh, number one. So that is uh, control number 10 on the map. And you can see they're going into third place. Our leader at that point, Katrin Müller, then Eileen Monson. So the leading time at that point, currently 29 minutes and 51 seconds. OK, back to the start then. You can see the conditions have already changed. This is Anna Dracorn. Uh, she, the 23-year-old, she was fourth in the European uh, middle distance champs. She was 23rd uh, yesterday. And one of the young Norwegians who seems to have been kind of breaking into uh, the Norwegian team over the last couple of years. This is Maya Sienoya, then our current mm, leader, compared to Katrin Müller, who made a mistake then yeah, in control it, number 21. You can see that she missed the control there. Um, women haven't really been in that section yesterday as the men were. They're not exactly there. So it's kind of new area between control 20 and 21. But you can still see that the gap there is not very, very big. But of course, I mean, this was a mistake by about 50 seconds, maybe. And here we have her in the picture, Katrin Müller.
Uh, but I think there's something there, there's strange something in the timing. Wrong. Because he's definitely not 25 minutes behind. See here, and uh, it's something quite typical here. I mean, we have this, it's quite a tough race, a physical tough race, and but you, and then we have this change in terrain, and you get into this technical part. We saw that yesterday in the Middle East, many runners had difficulties, keep direction, and then it makes it very hard when you're tired and you have to just keep on working all the way. You don't get any, anything for free there. You have to work every meter towards the control, and... I'm sure we'll see mistakes there in the end. So Sarah Hugstrom making her way out of the start. You could see her very, very quickly fold the map up, get a lot of map contact straight away, read this 1 to 15,000 map and make her way towards the first control. And she could be one to watch out for uh, on today's race, certainly. Mm -hmm. She is definitely a strong runner, performed well uh, uh, in many races. Uh, showed also in uh, Estonia that she can be really good in long distance. Had a bit, was a bit unlucky there when it came to this long route, but um, definitely a runner to look out for today. Uh, as is uh, Hannah Lundberg, and she was so excited and happy just to be back orienteering uh, this weekend. She's had missed basically the whole season through injury, um, and she was so delighted to be back. Mm, she was explaining in tears how happy she is yesterday to the Swedish Federation in one of the Instagram posts, so very, very cool for us as well as she, that she is back because she's definitely a runner that makes the competitions better. So Cecilia Anderson will be the next one I think we will take towards the finish. Uh, and she looks like she's had a pretty reasonably decent run. Um, of course, she will be behind Maya Sinaya, who um, was, has already made it to the finish there. But there's this kind of tricky little loop that um, from 25 onwards um, that we've noticed people have been making a few little mistakes. Yeah, but the thing is, I don't think it's so tricky from the beginning, no. but the runners are so tired, so if you don't... If you don't invest enough energy into the control taking, of course, you can miss a few seconds here, but I don't think we will see big, very big mistakes in this part. So back to the start then, catching up. It's a three minute start interval, but we, I think, are catching up on a few of the starts. We are uh, waiting for Lisa Risby to get her uh, position and get her race underway. Third in yesterday's middle distance, she looked really strong and is such a uh, consistent and capable forest mm, orienteer. She was very happy yesterday that she finally had the seconds on her side. She was uh, a few times just outside the top three. Uh, so she, she was very, very happy about that uh, yeah, top three position yesterday. So here is Cecilia Anderson, and you can see that she's just crossing the bridge on the way up towards the finish, looking for maybe a, a fourth or fifth best time behind teammate Joe Shepard, currently in third place. I know she'll get lots of cheering on here. And she's really managed to kind of up her consistency in the last few years of orienteering, getting a lot more experience under her belt of uh, what it's like to run on the World Cup circuit, uh, upping her confidence a lot. And she's a, she's a tough runner, so she will hopefully have enjoyed this um, long distance race. You can see that... Uh, you can look at the TV times, you can see maybe she had a good sector between controls two and three, losing a little bit more time at the end, I think, uh, compared to those runners um, around her. But uh, you can see lots of support there. Uh, we've had a schools competition here today, so they're all there ready to support her. She's going to come into the finish. It's going to be close to fourth place here for Cecilia Anderson. And I think she will just be slightly behind Anna Ovenson, so into fifth that place there for Cecilia Anderson of Great Britain. Mm, and here we have some GPS from this middle section between control 15 and 19. And you can see it's quite tricky orienteering there. It's uh, not as hilly at all as in other parts. You can see it here. It's different kind of vegetation on the ground. It's a bit stony. 
And how do people have to adapt their orienteering if you're going from that slope characteristic to something like this? What do you have to change in your well, technique? I mean, uh, first of all, I think that everyone will be very delighted to get out <laughs> of the slopes there. I mean, it's yeah. very... It's, it's kind of... Uh, it's, it's difficult to be fast in the slopes, but it's not the thing you enjoy most because either you're just you're running in the slope, parallel to the slope, which makes it quite uncomfortable to do, or then you're running up or down or on a path. So it's, it's not the funniest thing to do, but it's not easy to do. And then you get into this section where it's more technical and of course they will just enjoy it. And I don't think, I mean, of course you have to adapt and you have to be more precise in orienteering again. Um, but I think they will like to do that change, actually. Yeah, it's not the easiest thing, that slope orienteering on the, the mind or the body. But Sabina Hauseret is on her way next. She was eighth yesterday. And again, someone who will be enjoying that home advantage. How much home advantage do you think there is? On, on this race today, we talked about yesterday's middle distance. It was maybe a little bit more Scandinavian I mean, in quality. What do you think from kind of looking at the map for today's course? I mean, if we go back to Saturday, that was a big home advantage. It's this typical alpine terrain. You could also see Team Italy performing very well in this alpine terrain. Um, today, I mean, it's split it into two parts. I think the first part, the first half of the race, of course, it's a, it's it's an advantage to, to be from here and... Uh, have been running quite you're quite used to running this alpine terrain but then the se second part the, the forest we have been in yesterday uh, that's not it's not an advantage at all to come from switzerland because you, we have yeah we have very few forests like this in switzerland and you barely ever run in this kind of terrain so we're looking at denise kosova here 26th yesterday And you can tell there's quite a few people uh, in a group, but she looks like she's called up a few others, though. And we're not really going to pay too much attention to those times. That looks like it might be Alexandra Hornick. Maybe it is Hanna Wisniewska, I'm not sure. Hard to say. If he were at TV2, then it might have been Wisniewska. <laughs> Here's some more GPS. We have Zarina Kibbutz here compared to Maya Sianoya. Uh, we have a split there at control 17. We can give you, um, and there Zarina Kibbutz is uh, one minute and 11 seconds behind the leader. But compared to Sianoya, she is about 40 seconds behind 50 seconds. It was interesting to see that um, Serena Kibbutz came around on the path to the west uh, to control number 16. Um, maybe I think losing a little bit of time there. Um, I think it looks, even though there's a bit more undergrowth there, it's still good to go straight. But I think at some parts in a, in a long distance, you're trying to conserve energy and take a little fewer risks as we see her now towards control uh, 18. And a short one next to 19. Uh, the leader at that point is Mario Nappi, actually. So I think we will get the time at the next control. Or we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we don't mind, you know, looking on and um, enjoying this race here. Inga Dambe. On the way to the finish. Okay. 
Yeah, it looks like it will be definitely outside the top 10. There's quite a long um, run up to the last control. And when you've done 10.4 kilometers plus 480 meters of climb, it's the classic um, long distance feeling of just wanting to get to the finish, I think, at the end. Really trying to eke out the last bits of energy from your body and maintaining all the strength. And, and this is where the most physically strong runners are gonna you know, show that they are a class apart, I think, is on those last couple of kilometers. Grueling a long distance. <laughs> Okay, let's look at the comparison between Maya Sinoya and Ida Hapala. Mm, nice and mistake small mistake there, a bit of a mistake. You have to be very careful there. Uh, we have seen pictures before, and in other parts we have also noticed that yesterday that those contours, especially when they're two and a half meters high, they're very hard to see in the in the terrain. So if you don't have your direction all the way to the control. There can be small mistakes like this. And then, of course, this is not a very big mistake, but they're adding up over time. So if you do two or three of them, then it's easy to lose a minute. OK, let's head back to the start for Marie Taney. 12th yesterday in the middle distance. She's the bronze medalist from the European Champs Long. And Maybe we'll be looking to have a solid and fast run today. You can see we can see that the the Estonian forest of those European champs really suited the Finns. Uh, so really, really great results from them, particularly on the women's side of things. This is a whole different kind of terrain, a different challenge for that the runners have had to face. A lot of them have said it's felt like a very long season, um, especially with a focus on the sprint towards the first part of the season and then tougher later on. Yep, this is Ida Hapala. Ida Hapala. On the way to the second TV control. And maybe she's made up some time, because you see at our first TV split, control number 10, she was a little bit yeah, But she uh, has a few meters down. to go to this control. She does. First one control, and then she has to get to the split time. And you can see, unlike this part we've been in yesterday, it's quite flat here. Also, the vegetation is different. You have this far and quite off. Many places it's stony. You don't see the ground where you're stepping on. Yeah, and you have drops like that. You have the fallen trees, you have the ferns, the bracken. And this is the... Just taking a few extra seconds to, to make sure and to read all the detail. Lots of smaller hills in this section. So I think this is the reason why we have seen Sarina Kibbutz going all the way around there on the path. Uh, maybe you could have gone on the other way, on the other path. But just to avoid this kind of uncomfortable running in this vegetation. So about 2.52 behind. I think it shows she's had a good middle section uh, of the course. I think there we're not quite getting the uh, TV uh, split. Um, at that one. Simona Abasol yeah. still to go. But That's a pretty hefty yeah. Rubik's Cube. But do you cube. think how many competitions she has been working on that Rubik's Cube? <laughs> <laughs> many. Uh, well, when you're not allowed, you know, you're not allowed phones, you're not allowed pretty much anything. You're kind of a, a book and a Rubik's Cube. That's all you've got. But uh, let's have a look here because Carolyn Olsen's made a fantastic start. Mm -hmm. You can yeah. see that she was really running and the border of this out of bounds area then going quite low into the control there you could go all the way around try to take the climb on the path but she is coming to that first tv control very soon 
Yeah, this is, looks like it's worked mm, really well for her. This is the control, control nine, I think. Yep. Have her. She's a little bit behind, yes, indeed. Marie Ulausen in the lead at that point. You can see the time by Katrin Müller there as well. You can see it's totally different kind of underground here compared to this control uh, where we were before at 17, 18. Here it's really hard surface and uh, good runnability, but of course it's in the slope. Yeah, so here the climbing is the problem. Then uh, in the second part, you have to climb over the fallen trees and everything, over the woods. And it's that mix of terrains that makes it so complicated. Yeah, it makes it complicated and kind of hard because you have to be a bit flexible in your mindset. You have to do this different kind of fighting. First, you have to physically fight and you have to keep your, or you have to kind of force yourself to do the orienteering. Uh, concentrated all the way and then in the last part it's this the mix between the uphill and downhill running slope orienteering and the technical section but so let's take the finish this is catching muller and her times at the start are still pretty good but we can see that she's dropped um quite a lot of time losses i think uh towards the end so ultimately down into fifth sixth place um yeah, it would be interesting. Maybe we can have a chance to chat to her and find out what um, happened because she had good, some good times towards the start of this course. And here we have another Swiss mm. performing very well yesterday, Mario Nabi, especially in this part uh, where she is now. She's a bit off direction there, a bit too high in the slope. Now we are just behind her. She's trying to find. It's very good to see how she's trying to relocate here see the features i think she's close to control now hasn't seen the control yet here she get it she got it punching there you can see a tv control one she was about 255 behind of course uh, she's not compared to the same runners at that point it's later but no, this is a really strong uh, start and you can see she, she's evidently in really good shape and feeling confident as well. Super confident. But here's Tova Alexanderson. She'll have been the last one out of the quarantine uh, this morning or this afternoon even. And Lena Strand, third to last starter. She is, of course, a work, former world champ silver medalist in this discipline. Back in Norway 2019, she was 14th yesterday in that middle distance. So we'll see if this one is to suit her slightly more. I think there are so many kind of different types of terrain in this long distance. It's going to be someone who is able to kind of master all of them who's going to be able to take the win, I think. Let's look at Marion Abbey here. Mm -hmm. Now getting towards this third TV control, bouncing there. Yeah, it looks very good. So I think uh, that is the new uh, best time. Yeah, we haven't got the time into the system yet. But uh, it seems to be about the same gap as it was before. So I think we're going to take Denise Kosova then in here into the finish and this looks like it could be a new second best time i think yep she goes a uh, second best time okay now the, here is the first person who's gone the different direction and that's Eleanor what i, Ross, and that that's what I expected i think this is a very good route because you can take the climb in, in the beginning and then you can more or less run on the path all the way and you can approach the control from above which often is uh, quite a good thing to do because then you also have time and energy for the next control i was actually a bit surprised that we haven't seen other runners do that uh, so far yeah we haven't seen a kind of comparison of those different route choices but when we were looking yeah, maybe we'll see get one soon yeah, yeah when we were looking beforehand we kind of thought that that was going to be the the best way 
the, the and the I best checked way. the view of the split times of the early split times. It seemed that it was about a minute faster to go to the west there, around the out of bounds. Uh, area, but of course it's hard to say with the early starters. Sometimes uh, it's just a big difference physically as well. Here we have Elena Rus. Yeah, here she is on her way to this first TV split. Mm -hmm. We had her at the pre-warning. Looked very good there for her. Yeah, let's see what the it's going to be. There. Here we see. Yeah, so new leading time there for Elena Ross. A really good route choice then towards uh, control number nine. Try to see what her time was. If we have a split there before this long leg, not sure about that. At but, control eight. But back at the start, we have Simona Avasol. She is ready to go. She's got her compass out, ready to take the uh, map and get her run underway. She's the Europe, new European champion in the middle distance. She's got eight world champs medals to her name and she knows she didn't quite get it all right yesterday with a couple of minutes mistakes. Uh, for her. Just to get back to the route choice again, it's, we can say that it's a bit about half a minute faster to go where Enela, Elena Rose was going there, all the way around. So easy does it out of the start there for Simona Abbasold. Only one more starter left to go as we look at the route for Vindila Hochitkova. And uh, Katrin Miller has joined us in the commentary box. Uh, you looked like you had a really good start to your race, losing a little bit of time uh, later on. Tell us a little bit about how it went. Yeah, I came uh, quite good into the race. I felt quite comfortable with uh, also the route choice. I think uh, I solved it quite well. Um, and then to the 11th control, there uh, the hesitating began and uh, I felt that I kind of losing the energy and uh, yeah, it was quite hard to keep up um, with uh, the map reading and uh, then some mistakes. Uh, the, I think the, yeah, the, the one I lost most time was uh, before the arena passage, the 24. There I was kind of, uh, yeah, to the 23. I did a, a small detour, but uh, yeah, it was quite well um, that I found it then. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I lost uh, too much uh, of a climb and uh, when I saw the thing the animals eat there <laughs> that was quite discouraging because I knew now I have to go up 25 meters and then yeah oh. that was hard <laughs> yeah, that is hard right at the end of, of that course as well yeah. tell us about the route choice um, 8 to 9 then which way did you go did you go west take the climb first or east and uh, drop down first yeah I dropped down first um, I think uh, we were quite good um, prepared for this route choice and uh, I felt quite comfortable um, um, I saw when I went to the fourth control that this uh, route choice is coming mm -hmm. and then uh, yeah I felt quite good and also in executing it I feel uh, yeah I felt good and I think uh, I could uh, solve it quite well. And we see there is a change from the slope nature of the first part of the course especially when you go towards controls 15 16 the the forest we can see on the picture it changes quite a lot yeah and the contours change quite a lot mm -hmm. did you feel like you could adapt to that change? Yeah um, when we went to the quarantine in this morning we saw the passage over the street and then we knew okay it will go to this technical part mm -hmm. and then I really uh, tried to change a bit orienteering and uh, focus on the small details and I think that went quite well yeah yeah mm -hmm. um, more widely this this autumn you had a fantastic um, couple of races at the World University Championships yeah. you had a, a 20th place I think yesterday exactly um, you know it seems like lots of things are, are coming together uh, right at this moment for you what do you think uh, that's due to what, what is the cause of that uh, that's I think uh, a lot of parts came together uh, first, I think uh, also already for last year, I felt that uh, the joy of competing came back. Uh, that was before. I think I lost it a bit due to pressure I uh, did myself. And uh, yeah, now it's kind of the joy for, uh, for competing and also uh, to feel strong. I, uh, two years ago, I changed um, my trainers and I think that gave me a motivation. And uh, yeah, now with the joy and to uh, be out in the forest, just me, myself and uh, the map, <laughs> I think that's what, uh, yeah, what uh, did this uh, step. 
Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. We we've really seen it that it, that you things have kind of come together for you um, this this year and maybe not not the best race to especially towards the end today. But yeah. Anyway, congratulations yeah. and and thanks for talking to us. Thank you. All right. Let's head back then to the finish. Emily's Arneson finishing there into the new sixth place. Uh, while we were chatting to Katrin, we saw the uh, start of Tova Alexanderson. Her heading over there, and then we can look at Anjalova, who I think we will see towards the next uh, TV control, number 18. We don't quite have a, uh, the split times working quite as well for that one. Mm, but we have the pre-warning there. That's working pretty good. So, so she punched the control before there at into fifth position. Yeah, About two minutes is. behind. Here she is. Together with uh, Tune Bergerid Lia from Norway. Yeah, she's so three minutes behind. Yeah, so she's called up in those front three of minutes. Her, yeah. So here we have another comparison of this uh, long route. It would be very interesting to compare Elena Roos to this athletes here, but of course we're comp comparing to the leader in the finish. You can see here that both Hagström and Sianoja, they choose to climb on the path, which I think is a very good thing, but because usually it's a bit easier to take the climbing on paths. <laughs> We've seen Karlin Olsson before, she was climbing in the slope instead. And uh, very soon, I guess, we will have uh, Sara Hagström to this first TV control, first the pre warning and then the TV control. Yeah, let's see if we can spot she her. Yes, I guess. Through. See a pair and of flags. Yeah, and it's, I think it's really deceptive here. You can't really tell. Um, how how steep it is on the on the picture just the picture itself you just have to see the athletes uh taking all of that climb and showing just really how tough that is that's control number nine then we get the split at the next one it's eleanor ross who's leading uh, at that point we are last in second katrin muller into third but of course we're comparing a lot with our leader so that is maya c and noya so that's who we are comparing a lot of the times too, but it still looks good for Elena Ross with that route choice going high. It was interesting, Catherine Miller said they kind of had prepared that route choice, um, which was... But I mean, it's, it's, it's but not it, but so But we easy. didn't think it was the best one still. Yeah, but, but it's not so easy to prepare because you have this out of bounds area and you don't exactly know where the borders of that one are. Uh, we see that at the control before, Sarah Hagström was about a minute behind Elena Ross. Um, so it's a bit more, and I think it's mostly due to the root choice. You can also see that when Elena Rose came into the picture, she had much more energy left at that part. Of course, I mean, she spent the energy in the beginning, just mm -hmm. right out of the control. Just yeah, there's been a long here. climb up for Sarah Hagstrom. So equal time to Carolyn Olsen at the moment. Let's check here. The roots and Maria Lawson is looking mm, really good here. a good start into this race very soon to this second TV control. Guess we will have her in the picture soon. Yeah, our current leader at this point here is Marion Abbey, but here is uh, the Norwegian. She actually won the Swiss Long Championships. So she beat Simona Abbasold on home soil in the, the Swiss Long Distance Championships to take the win. So may, it shouldn't maybe be a surprise that we're going to see her uh, performing well here. Uh, she has been proving before in long, distance, long distances that she has uh, the ability to perform very well, uh, even if the competition is more than uh, yeah, 70, 80 minutes. Be quite a big lead here. Really good. Three minutes. Okay, Paula Gross, the next one to compare as she heads to our third TV split. We'll get the time at control number 23. And there's different route choices here. Maybe Paula Gross climbing quite a lot, I think, if you can then take that track. taking this yellow lane into the control. Of course, the control then is very easy. But as you said, you have to climb a bit more run all the way around it's i mean it depends a bit on your state if you're very tired this is very convenient because you don't have to work with the map there so you she might be investing in investing this uh energy and 
losing a bit of time on the route, but not risking anything. Yeah, of course, that's not the, the, the recipe to win the race, but maybe it's kind of... It's yeah. a safer yeah. route. I think I, I was chatting to some of the athletes who started quite near the beginning, and they were saying that, yeah, when it got to that point, they just wanted to uh, kind of play it safe. And they could tell that they were getting tired and they didn't want to be wandering around in that forest in circles trying to look for the control. So making a safe route choice. So I assume no, we're waiting we for her. No, let's go back to the uh, finish and we can look at Marion Abbey. And, ooh, she she's going to be in slow. The in yeah. The end. I thought this might have been a new leading time for Marion Abbey, looking at some of her times uh, earlier on in the course, but she has definitely lost time later. You can see, look, she's in the lead at TV control number two. And working hard here on this last section, but she will be slower than Maya Sinoya. That looks very strong physically still. Yes, uh, power to push, give it all here to the finish. Strong last few meters, but Losing time towards the end of the course. Uh, Let's look at Lisa Risby. Lisa Risby. She's had a good start. Remember, we're comparing to Maya Sino, who's the current mm -hmm. leader at the finish, but not the Compared current leader at that point. She was about half a minute faster than uh, Elena Roos when she left control eight. Also very interesting. We haven't seen that in the picture. Hannah Lund that has passed there. Um, she was in front of Roos as well at control eight and then lost about half a minute compared to this one second behind at the TV control here. So uh, I think I it was a very good route. route. Yeah. yeah, very good that's route. That's my guess. For, um, Here we have Elisa Risby. We can also see the effect now. They have chosen different route choices here. And as I said, about half a minute uh, separated them. So Before. that is control number nine. No, the, she is definitely behind yeah. Elena Rus here. It'll be the next control by the time we get the, uh, the actual split time. And Maria Lawson is still in that top three. She, we saw her later on in the course, looking very strong. Mm, and you can tell that Rizby lost quite a lot of time here. As I said, she was half a minute in front. She already lost one minute here. Will be more, will be about one and a half or even more. I mean, she's losing, of course, then she will be one mi about one minute behind. Here she is taking this climb. She's really actually making this look very mm -hmm. easy. If you compare to Sarah Hugstrom, she's um, looking very strong and, and very comfortable actually taking that climb, mm -hmm. much stronger than uh, Hugstrom, I think. Lost about 120 as well. I mean, it's, I think it's fair to say that the route choice there uh, by Elena Rose was really good. Here we have Sarina Kiburts in the picture. Hesitating there. And this is part of the Stopping terrain again. you're a little bit more familiar with. But as you can see, the, the visibility is quite varied. There's the control. But quite well done anyway. She was uh, hesitating, stopped, tried to relocate, took a few steps, stopped again to be sure. Now that you can go see that Sabina Hauswirt is going all the way down. That's maybe not necessary. And then climbing there. We haven't seen that before. It will be interesting to see. Uh, Hauswirt was in third position at the control before. About, about yeah, 40 seconds ahead of Elena Roos. And you can see that she has aimed off. Well, it will hit the stream and go up the stream to get to the control, control mm -hmm. number nine. I mean, the control is not difficult. No. Uh, no matter from which direction you come, it's only that she will have uh, many meters climbing in her legs when she approaches that control. And then, of course, she has to continue in this slope. 
Yeah, here she is. So about 40 seconds was the advantage for Sabina House. We had at control eight. So the control before this pre-warning. Yeah, she's the only one we've seen drop uh, all the way down to the larger track. Take the running there, but of course that means you've got more climb. And yeah, if we have a little look now compared to Eleanor Ross, and she hasn't even got the control where we take the time mm. at yet, you can see that's a big time loss, I think. And we had Lisa Rispi lost about a minute and 20. See if it's about the same here. I my guess is that might be a bit more. Let's see. So she has about 40 seconds left. We compared her to Lisa Rispi and her time loss. So I think the time loss for Hauswirt on this route is not massive. It's it's quite the same if you go all the way down or if you stay a bit higher in the slope. But uh, of course, I mean, she loses one and a half minutes compared to Elena Rose here as well. And so we can probably just about hear her. Here she comes through the terrain. Yeah, you can hear that it's <laughs> tough here. Yeah. But she's still looking pretty strong up this hill. You can see her lift her head to try and spot the control. But you can just, you can see that she, from the pre-warning, so from the control before uh, this control here, we saw her punch there. She lost more than 10 seconds compared to Elena Rose. And of course, I mean, it's not it's not finished at that control nine uh, because then she, Elena Rose has the advantage from coming above. So she ha can continue with fresh legs and uh, Sabine Hauswirt has to push with, uh, yeah, some tired legs there, so she keeps on losing for some a few more seconds. So here's Ida Hapala. This was her through control number 23. And into fifth place for her there. So pretty good uh, for the Finn at this point. She was 29th um, yesterday. And we know that Katrin Muller makes a mistake, the control after this one, and, and drops quite a lot of time towards the end. So uh, maybe looking to climb a couple of places. Let's look at uh, the splits here. Mm, you can see that Sianoia was quite good here in this section. Not any bigger problems. Here we are with Johanna Öberi. She was very direct through the terrain with Sianoia. Looked. Uh, like she had really good direction, the compass, and able to, uh, I think, move now very quickly. She's through hesitating. The terrain. Mm. You can see that she's turning uh, in almost all the directions. That's often not a very good sign. Now she has spotted another runner. I think that's Victoria Hester Bjornstad. for a small depression here. <laughs> so you can see a very slower than the current leader as they make their way towards this 18th control. <laughs> So Johanna Oberi caught up the three minutes uh, on Victoria Hester Bjornstad and the two of them now going to have a bit more of a, a running route before making their way back to the middle distance area terrain. Let's go back to control numbers nine and ten. Oh, we can have a little look at the splits actually at TV2. So that's control 18 where we've just seen... Um, and you can really see, I mean, in this first section, I mentioned it before, maybe the home advantage is a bit 
bigger compared to the second part. And you can see that the Swiss runners performed well in this slope orienteering section here. So, Paolo Gross here mm. on this last section. Looks like there's no trouble here. So we'll soon see her towards the finish, live with her now. It's quite a long run in towards the finish, so you can tell she's going to be... See, that is a, the tail is two minutes, so she's going to be about two minutes slower than Maya Sinoya, who's still our leader. And what you can say about Maya Sinoya, she was great across all of the different types of terrain, and I think especially the kind of more technical, intricate contour terrain towards the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paula Gross may be into a third position, or most likely into a third position. Can't spot her yet. No, she should emerge in the, the forest at uh, some point in the distance. That's quite a long run in. Uh, I think she's coming here. Yes, indeed. She was the best Swiss runner at the European Champs long distance with a seventh place for her. That was really a kind of a feels like a a breakthrough moment for her in terms of results. And was I know she was really quite happy a, with that performance. Quite a good finish here at the pre-warning. She was more than two minutes behind, just uh, or at TV3, I mean. So this last section here was quite good, about half a minute faster compared to Sianoya. And now we are here waiting for Elena Roos to come to the second TV control. She is still performing well here. Yeah, this looks really fantastic from us here as we'll see her drop into the 18th control. Of course, we'll compare her to Marie Ulausen and not to Sianoya. Or to, uh, compared to uh, Ulausen is not in this list here at TV2, but I can tell you that she has a better time than Mario Nabi there. I don't know why she's not in the graphic. Oh, and I think that's Caroline Olsen there. So ah, the two of them running of, together. Oh yeah. oh yeah, there is she is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Elena Ross has caught up six minutes on Carolyn Olsen. She is not really together. There's a few seconds in between them. So, they're really strong four minutes quicker than uh, Marion Abbey. We don't have uh, uh, Marie Olausen's route there. You could see her just <laughs> let, just get the little vantage point and try and look around a few extra and seconds just to make sure. This is interesting now. Benjaminsen, she had a good time uh, at this eight control. She was about a minute and 20 faster than Elena Rose, and then she decided to take the same route as an El Elena Rose here. So I think uh, this is a good time. We should have her time at S and D's. We have. We yeah, have the time so here, here that's she a replay. is into the control. Uh, and let's see what the time difference is compared to Elena Ross. That's the control where we'll get the punch. And so it looks really good it's here. 1.45 ahead. 1 minute 45 ahead of Elena Ross. That is a big, big mm -hmm. gap this early on, I think. It was about, yeah, it was 1.20 at the control before. So she is just pushing away from Elena Ross a little bit. OK, so the next athlete we're looking for. Serena Kibbert. She was 17th uh, in yesterday's middle distance race. And here she is, I think, on the edge of this arena. Thank you. 
So Switzerland's Serena Kibbert is on the final few stages and it looks quite good for a fourth fastest time here. There she is on the run in and after that 10.4 kilometers of running it will be fourth place for her. Okay, let's have a comparison here. Is Megan Carter Davis? Mm, it kind of seems as if she has recovered well from the relay. Had a tough race there. Yeah, she had a tough couple of races, the relay and the, the middle distance, to be honest. But, but this one is quite is okay, actually, so far. Much better than the days before, at least. Yeah, I think for her, it's been a lot about trying to get some learning points from being in this terrain. And she's she's not that, that experienced in this type of terrain at all. But I mean, she you know, her proving, shape is still pretty good. And she has been proving that she is very good in long distance mm -hmm. as well. When she was, uh, I think she was she top top six at the yeah world she was six at the world championships. Yeah. Yep. In Czech Republic, she's of course a sprint world champion as well. And this seems to be, at the moment, by far her best uh, run of this long weekend. Would be very good for her to get this feedback that she can perform well here uh, in order to get some motivation towards the next season as well for the winter training. Yeah, I know a lot of the British team are going to stick around for another, another week to do some training in this type of terrain or similar terrain towards uh, next World Championships. Oh, she's hesitating here. I think she's not gone far enough. No, I think she needs to go a little bit further than this hill here. Here's the camera, so here's and the control. The control. So just a little bit of making sure in the circle to get all the orienteering right, but so far at least this is definitely her best race of the competition so far. So soon we'll see Ida Hapala into the finish. Mm -hmm. And at the TV3, after about uh, one hour and 20 minutes, she was in fifth position. About two minutes behind Sianoya. Here she is. Still checking the map a lot, really carefully. The last control is in the same position as uh, as yesterday's, so a familiar end to this course. And it has been really great to see the Finns improve a lot in the last few years. Of course, we saw them perform really, really well in the European Championships, but more widely across the sprint and across the uh, different types of terrain as well. You've seen them do a really good job. Now Thierry Georgiou coaching the Finnish team. But also, it just seems like they've got a lot more experience. There was a bit of a changing of the guard with the, the Finnish team. A lot of the kind of newer, younger athletes uh, going into the team. And now we are let's waiting have a look for Abersolt to the first TV control. She had a good start at the control before. She was uh, ahead of Benjaminsen, two seconds ahead. Uh, now, now she, equal time. Yeah. So I, my guess is that they had the same route choice, but maybe we'll get... Uh, to see that later. But Maya Sina is still our leader at the finish. There are, of course, a lot who can come and beat that time. We've seen Elena Ross, the likes of maybe Maria Lawson, do a good job uh, towards the latter part um, of the races. In fact, let's have a look at Maria Lawson. This is a comparison towards Maya Sina, and the gap is good here. Yeah, it's about two minutes. No, the, the tail is two minutes. So, so the it's, gap uh, is way more than two yeah, minutes. Yeah, it's about four minutes here. And we're now, I think, as we may be live with her. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Here's Maria Lawson. Haven't seen that control very often so far. No, but she. That's a really good race by Maria Lawson. 
Yeah, so you've just got to check the detail uh, we here. Seen, we have seen that many times in this race, this stop and go. It's much more clear compared to the middle distance. I mean, it's a bit due to the tiredness, but of course also due to the scale. Mm. I mean, it's much harder to see, especially when you're tired and read the map in a detailed area on a 15,000 map. Do you think most athletes run with magnifiers? Oh, I, I don't think so. I don't think no? so. They just got really good eyes then. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, usually you should. I mean, usually, usually the map should be drawn in a way so that you don't need it. And here we have two with Alexanderson, and she had a good start as well. She was 25 seconds ahead at control eight, but it seems as if she went down. So uh, on this route, so let's see if that is affecting the result here. You could just time. see you're on all fours having to climb up this hill here towards control uh, number nine, I think. And let's have a look, let's check here. So Alex Anderson does go down, but then takes the climb quite early in this. If you compare to Maya Sienoya, Maria Larson goes uh, Would have been route. interesting to compare to Benjamin's and the old instead. And we'll soon get her split time at control number 10. Here Let's she see is, here she is. Good. It's looking very good. She's so strong, she can. Yeah, she's run just one. making that <laughs> easy going she, she up there. Wants. Goodness me, there well, we go, 31 seconds ahead. And of course, we haven't seen what uh, route Simona was running, have we? No, I don't think so. So, Maya Sinaya compared to Anna Drickon, the Norwegian. An advantage for Sinaya here. And uh, as before, the tail is two minutes, so and the dude corn is about two minutes behind, quite exactly. Guess we'll see her in the picture soon. If the cameramen are in position again. <laughs> Here we go, this is the control. Let's get the static camera instead. Let's see if we can spot her coming over the brow of the hill. Here she is. It's a bit more than two minutes. Uh, we never get the time to stop there. But at the Similar time to Paolo Gross, I think. But it's, uh, I mean, we compare her to runners there. It's a strange split there because of, we have had Elena Roos there, Marie Olausen, and we don't see them in the graphics. So I can tell you she is at the control before, six and a half minutes behind Elena Roos to 10th position. So recap those current standings. Maya Sina is still in the leader's chair. Marion Abbey into second place. Paula Gross in third as well. So my guess at this second TV control is that we get actually the times only from the runners that have read out their SC bricks yet. So we shouldn't really take this one as an indication, maybe compared to the runners in the finish, but not to the one out in the forest. But Maya Sino has got very comfortable here, although I, I think she can tell there's maybe some people like Maria Larson going to come through soon to take a new uh, leading time. I think we'll see her very soon, actually, the Norwegian. She's had a really strong uh, long distance. Let's have some comparison there between some of the leaders. Lena Strand did the climb. We can now Abersold also say that really both Abersold and Alexanderson went ex almost exactly the same route there. Uh, Alexanderson climbing a bit more straight after this out of bounds area. But then Abersold goes up there, the really steep bit. Has to go back again to see that in this part, uh, Alexanderson is a bit more recovered uh, of running on the path there, but very equal. This section. 
This is Hannah Lundberg. I think so, yes. You're right. This must be around control 1718, I think. Mm -hmm. As uh, she and will get the tech second TV split. Compared to Elena Roos, she was only one second behind at the first TV control. Uh, Compare them to Abby here, but actually the leader at this part of the race is Elena Roos. Yeah, so it's hard to tell, I think, here. We've only got the times here of those who've reached the finish and downloaded. So I think she's you. a little bit slower compared to Elena Ross. I can uh, tell you at the control before she was punching there, three minutes and 52 seconds behind Elena Ross and about two and a half minutes behind Mario Lausen. So she lost quite a lot of time here in this section between TV1 and TV2. Checking the control code to get the punch. And she's faster than Abby, but we know Eleanor Ross, Maria Lawson uh, went quicker still at this certain control. Here's Lisa Risby, who had made a good start, slightly off line to 16, but manages to get control into that number 16. And then We'll very shortly see her get the new time check at control number 18. Well, we don't know if we get the time check, but we get to see her in well, the camera, we'll get to in see the picture. Her. <laughs> yeah, we haven't seen is. everybody through there. Here she is, though. And just remember, she looked so strong climbing uh, up the hill. Mm, and now we the can first yep, check. have her to compare with Hannah Lundberg here. But... Uh, if we compare her to Elena Roos, the control before, she's 2 minutes and 21 seconds behind. So she will be faster than Anna Lundberg, but not faster than Elena Roos. And again, she just pauses where a lot of the others have done, I think, on the brow of this hill. So make sure you read all the detail. That hill is... A form line and a contour, or well, one contour high then. But it's quite obvious in the terrain. And then looking for. There we go. The depression. And the time is good compared to Hannah Lundberg, but she will be slower, I think, than Eleanor Ross. So now we are waiting for Sabine House. We are to this 17th control. It's the control where we get the splits. So it's easier for us to compare there. Uh, the official TV split is a control A team, but we are missing a few of the runners there, or the times of the runners uh, there. So live with Hasfit here on this mixture, semi-open, semi-forested area where you've got these quite small, intricate contour shapes. That looks to be pretty good so far. Here she is in the picture. Sabina Hauswirt. She's I think she's taking a climb up here towards control 17 for me. It's in one of these re-entrants. There we go. So this is the 17th control. We get the time check at the next one. Or we so get the time check here. We get the time check here, we so do. She's into she fourth place. Yeah, 229 behind Elena Ross. Uh, eight seconds behind Lisa Riesby. And 
the orienteering kind of change. There's, there's, there's not very much changes in vegetation here at all, so... I wonder if she's a little bit too far to the right. It's hard to tell. You can see how the runners are taking it very carefully here in this section. Don't want to lose map contact at all, of course. And actually, there's quite a lot of a lot of kind of short, uh, short, medium length controls on this course where the map contact is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, when we were looking at the map first time, it's always two or three shorter <laughs> controls, and then there's a longer control coming. And often it's kind of a change on. Uh, the technique on the longer controls, of course, it it's often leads to a change in terrain as well. So let's take Marie Olausen to the finish here. Oh, now this is surely a new best time here for Marie Olausen. Look at that, the gap ahead of Maya Sienoya is huge here for the Norwegian. This is a really fantastic race. And Sienoya has sat in the leader's chair for a while, but no longer as Maria Lawson has had a fantastic race here. 85 minutes for the Norwegian. Really strong for her from her. Mm, very good performance by Maria Lawson, especially physically, I think. Uh, we haven't seen... I mean, we, we don't get to see so many of the controls, which often is a good thing because we don't see the mistakes then. Uh, but I think it was a very strong performance. We are on about 85 minutes. The expected winning time is uh, 80 minutes, so not too far away. No, and to make a, a gap of that that much, but, uh, it's exciting. We said we, we don't see so often uh, <laughs> GPS, now we get to see uh, here. I think it's a good choice to go up to the path there all the way around. Um, it's yeah, very see. tough to run in the slope there, and it's so steep. You can feel it from the cliffs, from the rocks there. Oof. I wonder if Alexanderson is losing the race here. See, it's clearly faster, but Apperson and Benjamin are doing, and she is losing time there. Two minutes is the tail. Wow, that is a lot of time. And now she's too high as well, time. and now has to drop back as well. Like she lost about three Oof. minutes or more there, three and a half minutes. Yeah. That is incredible. But that's exactly stuff to something yeah. that you, if you're used to this kind of terrain, you, you're never going to do that. So I don't think that. Uh, that's exactly the home advantage. I mean, the I mean, the Swiss runners, they have been running so many times in this alpine terrain. So you know, if it's steep like this, if you have those cliffs and rocks in the hill, then that's an indication for, it's, it's an absolute no-go to go there. So that was uh, Joanna Oberi into control number 23, still running alongside Victoria Heister Bjornstad at that particular point. And here's Eleanor Ross as well. So uh, we're comparing her to the new leader, Maria Lawson, and she's still got that time advantage going fairly close to the line mm -hmm. on this control number 22. Slightly under two minutes, maybe one and a half minutes advantage for Elena Ross. No bigger problems here to this control. Now we have got her in the picture to TV control three. Yep, so dropping down the slope towards a small re-entrant um, here. Has to be really exact on the compass. But there is quite a big kind of rocky, stony area to be a catching feature should you go past. But no need for that for Eleanor Ross. This is really good from the Swiss runner. And we can say yet uh, about TV2, so the control before TV2, the gap between Roos and Olausen was 1 minute and 14 seconds. It's about the same now, but some hesitations here for Elena Roos. Is she missing the control? Oh, yes. Controls here, oh, oh, here she is. So she lost about 10 seconds between those two controls, TV2 and TV3. Yeah, replay of just a small miss for Ross. And uh, also soon in the picture, I think we will see Andrina Benjaminsen. You can see she is 
quite much ahead of Olausen here. Got her at the punch at control 17. Tell it because we don't really get it at control 18. And there she's in the lead, 135 ahead of Elena Roos. Yeah, you can see she's uh, caught up uh, to Rosie Yanashikova and making really light work of this. I think this terrain just really, really suits her. And we can tell she's incredibly strong from yesterday's silver medal. I wonder, you know, if she's one of the, those who can make the most advantage of Tova Alexanderson's uh, mistake in the route choice to control number 12, and that's a new leading time. I, I mean, we could both see uh, Abersold and Benjaminsen having a huge advantage there. <laughs> All very impressive so far from Andrina Vienemesen from Norway. <laughs> she, she's not happy at all with her start. That's all I could hear there. <laughs> so live with Marika Taney here. Um, it's not been quite a good, as good a day for her. This terrain, if we talk about the terrain suiting somebody like Anduna Benjamins, and it doesn't seem to suit Marika Taney as much at all. She's a bronze medalist. European champs in the long distance, but this terrain is very, very different to that of Estonia. The climb is only one of those factors. Mm, a big see, factor, also, though. You can also see here, she's a little bit off direction. Could be a bit closer to the red line. Okay, and we can have a really short word with our um, leader, Maria Larson, before she has to go back onto the leader's chair. Um, and how was your run? Describe it overall. Uh, it was a tricky start, and I did a mistake on the first control. And I felt like uh, the second and third was also a little bit hard to take because the details were so big, bigger than I expected. Uh, but then I get, got into it quite good, and wasn't sure about the long, uh, long legs and so on, but you just have to do take a route choice and then hope for the best. So I'm satisfied. Yeah, you just have to c commit to a route choice, don't you? And, and what about the kind of detailed section towards the middle and towards the end of the course as well? Yeah, it was a tricky long distance, would I say. Uh, short legs with many details and then over to long details with the quite steep hills, so you get quite tired. But uh, yeah, it was really fun long distance. But you've had a lot of success uh, running in Switzerland at the Swiss Long Champs as well. What do you like about this uh, running here? Uh, I don't know, but I quite kind of like the steep hills. And uh, yeah, uh, I think that's good for me. And yeah, uh, the technique is quite good too, but uh, you have to take right route choices and you never be sure when you run. So yeah. It's hard, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. I will let you get back to the leader's chair. And uh, good luck on your way towards uh, the World Champs uh, next summer as well. So we just saw Marika Taney uh, also looking for her time. So, yeah, interesting to see that, interesting to hear that you, you know, you, you just have to kind of commit to a route choice. You don't really know uh, whether it was any good or not. Yeah, but, I mean, of course, it's not just committing. You have to pick the right one <laughs> as well. <laughs> Uh, you don't solve the problem with just committing, but of course, in the end, if, you're do if you don't know if one or the other is better, then you have to you have to decide for one of them and then just execute it and hope for the best. I think that's what she wanted to say with with her, her phrase. You have to commit to one of them. Let's see here now. We have Simona Abersolt compared to Andrine Benjaminsen and Mari Ulausen. Let's see now. There's a the clear lead for Abersolt there, about a minute ahead. We had the punch at control 17 for Abersolt, and there the lead was 1 minute and 24 seconds ahead of Benjaminsen. And Benjaminsen was another one and a half minutes ahead of Elena Roos. So it's looking good for those two runners.
Yeah, looking really, really good for Abersold. I'm sure we'll pick her up very soon on the pictures. Here's the Control 18 in the foreground here, and we can see her drop into the Control. And yeah, she's really just managed to kind of eke out time on the on the others as we as she goes further in towards the Control. But she's losing a little bit of time on on this. Control here on number 18. Mm -hmm. She is, indeed. Yeah, where is she? Not in the picture, at least. <laughs> so what was her time? At here she there is. There we go. Oh, and it was uh, 1.24 before, so, so she lost about half a minute. Maybe we'll get a replay of the GPS here. And very interesting it will be to see how the time for Tuve Alexanderson developed behind. Uh, let's see here, we get this GPS. Here we see Alexanderson behind. Uh, the gap is so big. Yeah, so I mean, even at Alexanderson's speed there, that's, that's going to be hard. It's quite equal between uh, Ulausen and Alexanderson. But here you can see Alexanderson's speed on the flat, just the raw speed of where, the way she's able to get the gap on Ulausen, I think. Maybe we get to see this section a bit longer so we can see the time loss for episode to control 18. Then we'll zoom out a little bit. But now we're live with Alexanderson, so she's just past control 15. So that was Abasol punching control number 18. I really want to see if there was something we can get from the GPS tracking between 17 and 18. I'm sure we'll see it later on when we get Alexanderson into the picture. But Maria Larson back in the leader's chair. And on the phone. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, she seemed to be more satisfied when she talked to us than now when she's talking to someone else on the phone. <laughs> well, there's probably something about uh, talking to a broadcast, you know, that you've, you've got to be a little bit more positive. But Jono Berry is here, and uh, oh, well, will she be in for a new second or third fastest time here for the Swede? She was 11th uh, in yesterday's long uh, middle distance. She took sixth place in the European Champs long. She's such a, again, a forest specialist, I'd say. And it really pays off here. She's just taking the last few strides. And pumping those arms hard to get into a new second fastest time then. Just three seconds quicker than Maya Sienaya. So, a strong and consistent performance, I think. If we look back over the times, they're still maybe looking for a top 10 result. By the time we see some of the others in towards the finish. And I think the next person we're going to be looking in towards the finish will be Eleanor Ross. Because I think, and, and just <laughs> as if is. I knew something, there she is. Good spot. Mm -hmm. Her quicker than Olausen here. The gap is not very big here. Uh, we had it before at the third TV control. There it was a minute and two seconds. It might be about the same still. So very soon we will see Elena Rose in the pictures towards the finish. Yeah, the crowd are going to wait for her and it looks, well, she's one of the few. We saw Lena Strand take the higher route choice towards control number nine as well, but she was one of the only ones to do that. And I had, I mean, her start was really fantastic there. But maybe some time losses later on. Here she is on the way to the last control. You can see the gap around one and a half minutes now. So it is clearly a new best time here for the Swiss runner. Oh, 
now the Swiss cowbells ring to welcome her into the finish. Just a few metres to go. We'll see her punching this, con this last control. Here she is. And, you know, maybe she is a bit more than a sprinter, but I think she's more than proved herself in the forest here today. She makes the running look so easy and reaches for the line to take a new leading time then 58 seconds quicker than Maria Lawson so Eleanor Ross is the new leader quite equal speed here from the third TV control to the finish only four seconds uh, the difference between Olausen and Rose here on this last kilometers Oh, seems I'm to be sorry. quite satisfied. Yeah. I mean, we haven't well, seen it's hard to be problems. unsatisfied when you when you come into the finish. It's a new leading time, but I mean, no, we didn't really see her making any mistakes. Mistake, of, mistake, of course, uh, she would not have been so satisfied. We have seen a few hesitations just before TV3, but otherwise it looked quite good. Yeah, we have to the Alexanderson towards this uh, second TV control, and you can see she is behind. We had her at the control before, almost exactly four minutes behind Simona Ebersold. Yeah, so she's slower than Eleanor Ross here, and she was the last starter, so at the moment outside of a medal position. But I think there's actually, opportunity to catch up. We actually got all the times now into the graphics here. Oh, yes. We have indeed. And if we remember back, it was the route choice sticking in the slope towards control number 12 that was really lost us some time. But you can see just the speed through the terrain here is so much better than a lot of the other runners. And she and is very direct into this control too. Only on the, between those two controls here, she was 20 seconds faster compared to Abersold. But also we know Abersold has done a mistake here to this control. So it's hard to say how much the be speed, how much the mistake. And if you think about European champs long, she made mistakes early on in that race as well and clawed back to a second place silver medal in that one. Um, you know, if anybody can claw back some big time losses like that, it's her. Here's the finish there, Caroline Olsen in on the last few uh, steps. It looks like she was caught up, overtaken by Eleanor Ross and goes ultimately into sixth place, but seven minutes down. So... Not her best result today. Here's Hannah Lundberry. Let's see her route towards control 23, where we'll see her next. Comparison, of course, to Eleanor Ross, our new leader, and the tail on the GPS tracking is two minutes. And we know that in the finish, the gap between uh, Mario Lausen and Johanna Oberg is almost, or Eleanor Ross and Johanna Oberg is almost seven minutes, so there's plenty of time for Anna Lundberg to get in between somewhere. Getting towards the third TV control here. Yep, the, the control is just down the slope. There it is. Into third position. Uh, almost four minutes behind Elena Rose. That's pretty solid. I mean, I'm sure her, her physical shape isn't quite where she wants to be right now. I think we could see that. Not as good as it has been, but... She's a very young runner who is getting uh, who's getting more and more experience every single time she runs. Alexanderson picking up some water there. Let's see some of the drinking technique. Yeah. Always punch the control first and then yep. drink. That's uh, what you learn as a junior already. So this is control. That was control number 19, by the way. Uh, and then there are a few little bits of kind of running through the pastures and running through the towns on this and kind of linking up all these different areas and that kind of allows us to get the, these different kind of types of terrain. But the current standings at uh, split number two with that's control 18 with everybody having gone through there. Simona Abbasold with a 55 second lead. Eleanor Ross, who is our current leader at the finish is in third place, Tova Alexanderson, exactly one minute slower than Eleanor Ross. So we will soon get some more information on people into the finish. Here, Here we have, uh, more GPS, Sabina Hauswirt, Mario Lausen, and uh, the leader in the finish, Eleanor Ross. 
See the differences here between the Rus and the Ulaus, and the Rus went a bit more up on the path. I took the climbing on the path there. You see that Hauswirt and Ulausen almost took the same route here. Maybe Hauswirt is a little bit lower in the slope here. Heading towards those small tracks we have seen yesterday already. Many of the runners of on this long leg in the middle distance were heading towards those tracks there. Hauswirt was at the second TV control. She was about two minutes behind Elena Rus, at two and a half minutes. Here she is. Again, still making pretty good progress here, just pausing to read the detail. You can see, yeah, just how high the undergrowth is in, in some of these parts. You can see some of these open areas are quite uh, distinctly in the sunshine here. Is she, is she talking to herself? Some people do that. And it's yeah, it's a, very common, yeah? it's a very common technique to keep up focus. So you talk to yourself in order to tell yourself what you want to see. And it makes, yeah, it makes you not lose uh, focus. But it, we, don't, we don't hear that that often when we have uh, runners in the broadcast. She knows she's really close. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, really talking to herself. Yeah. She could see the camera. She knew uh, the control was really close, but just slightly, slightly in the wrong direction. But that was the control. So into third place there. I'm not sure. The next, the I think next the next one? control oh, the next will one. be the, the split. The next one's control number 23. So uh, she lost some time here compared to Elena Roos between the second TV control and this third TV control. This is this open lane, this yellow bit here. You can see very clearly. She really does have a stop and go uh, technique. And again, I love how we can hear her talking to herself, just keeping that focus. And, and especially when you get towards the end of the course, you think about how much, how long she's been running already. That just keeping that focus is so important. And this is going to be tight between Anna Lundberg and Sabine Hauswirt. Only one second between the two of them. So Sabine Hauswirt into fourth position, 3-4-54 behind Elena Roos. And I think this is Lisa Risby. It is Lisa Risby stopping Hesitating. still here. Yeah, taking a step in one direction, then changing. This is Off not a very good sign. Mm -mm. <laughs> Uh, no, that was either at control uh, 22 or 23. Okay, let's have the comparison then. Looking at Andrea yeah. Reni Minson, who we, we should see next one to control 23. Closer towards the decision here. Benjaminsen will most probably end up in one of the top three, climbing Ooh. all the way, taking the street there around. Uh, we've seen that before, then she can take this entrance there, this yellow li line. It's, I think it was Sarina Kibbutz maybe who did that. Yeah, there are a few people who kind of, yeah, take a little bit extra climb on that leg, but it's it's a bit of a safety net. I mean, if you have the leg for it, <laughs> the yeah, for it yeah. then why not? If you're feeling good and it just, I think, take maybe take some of the pressure off the, the accuracy and you can just focus on the running as well. 
Alonso dropping down the slope. But this time looks really good. Mm, this will be a new best time if she's not missing one of those two controls. Just reading the detail and or maybe even looking at the kind of the route, the next route out of the control where she needs to head next. I'm not sure if she, I mean in the tricky part like this, but as if you haven't seen the control yet, you usually don't start to plan the next one. You do that as soon as you see the control. Okay, let's have another look. Here's uh, Anishikova. We know she was caught and then I think dropped by Andrina Benjaminson. Seems like the Czech athlete has had a, a bit of a breakthrough in terms of the forest disciplines. She's been top 10 in sprint world championships, uh, but she was 10th in the European champs long distance race, 10th in yesterday's middle distance race. It really feels like things are coming together for her in terms of the forest. And so equal sixth place then for her. It's Benjaminson again. Mm -hmm. Some replay. So Benjaminson at TV3, two minutes and 44 seconds ahead of Elena Roos. Quite a comfortable lead here. About uh, 15 minutes before the finish. Or about now, nah, about 10 minutes before the finish, maybe. Thumbs up from Eleanor Ross with the mascot for next year's World Championships. Again, just a replay of that. Her Eleanor Ross ahead there. We're looking for Hannah Lundberg next. So we'll soon see the young Swede into the arena and mm -hmm. into the last control in the finish. It's a chance to get that third spot from Johanna Urberi. Johanna Urberi with a time of 1.30.42. And uh, Lundberg has been out for 1.27, so that should be good enough for this third position. Yeah, let's see if we can spot her coming out of the forest. Yeah, this is looking strong for a new third best time. Uh, there she is. If you remember, In she the had, shadow. Yeah, there she is. She had such a breakthrough last year. Winning the middle distance race in Idra, fourth place in the long distance. Um, maybe the, the biggest part of her season yet to come for the Junior World Championships in Portugal. Those forest races being postponed because of threat of forest fires. They'll take place in November instead. So maybe that's something she's going to be building up to. But... Hannah Lundberg, it will certainly be a, a third best time for her. And once more, showing that she is young, but she's got that consistency. Really Yeah, has. and I mean, it's very early after her injury, and uh, her, I mean, this is kind of her comeback, and she's already up there again, maybe finishing in the top 10 here. So that's a very strong performance, a very strong comeback of uh, this very young runner. Yeah, she was seventh in the middle distance race, into third here, 441, slower than Eleanor Ross, but really strong. Now let's have a look then at Simona Abersold, mm -hmm. because... So you can see there's still an advantage yeah. for Abersold. It's about a minute. They go into this climb, and let's see if they take different routes here. We know that Benjaminson went all around, and we see that Abersold is doing the same. Maybe a tactical decision, getting down to this yellow lane all the way, leaving it a bit early, but getting to the control quite safely there. Here we have her in the picture. Oh, that's very strong then from Abersold. See, she has two minutes left to get to this TV control. 
and it looked like uh, the gap was kind of a minute and a half then she made a kind of a small mistake at control number 18 it went back to about a minute but it looked to me that she was very strong on that uphill section mm. and maybe pulled a little bit of time away from Benny Minson. It was uh, exactly 55 seconds at the second TV control and it seems to be a bit more now but uh, of course we are talking seconds here we not can hear minutes. Her It's a leading position so far, but 1 minute 16. About 20 seconds faster between TV2 and TV3 compared to Andrina Benjaminsen. Of course, she's going to have really no idea how well she's performing. There is a little bit of a coaching zone at control number 25. She might get some feedback about um, how she's doing and the just that she needs to kind of keep that stable orienteering towards the end when you, oh, these athletes are getting so tired and that's when sometimes the orienteering can go a bit AWOL. So Simona Abbasold through TV control number three. We've just got Tova Alexanderson to come, but it's not gone Tova's way today. Should be there in about... That's a few minutes. I mean, we have the starting interval of three minutes. Then she was another four minutes behind at the control, at the TV control before. So it should be a few minutes waiting for her. Here we are with Sabina Hauswirt. Yeah, you can hear. Here, <laughs> I have to go down. She said. Very interesting, but be interesting to hear from Lisa Rispe if it's how it feels to run with a runner that's talking to herself. Because well, it's, if I, you're an orienteer, you've probably heard somebody in the yeah, terrain. Yeah, no, doing but that. if you run together with someone, it's always kind of strange because every now and then you just think that they're talking to you and it distracts you a little bit. But of course, I mean, they're good enough to just ignore it. Yeah, definitely. This looks like Marie Cataney. In the last part of the course, I think. Yep, yeah, we're alongside Spina House as well. Crossing over the stream, and they're really close to the arena at this point. See, there's quite a lot of water in this stream here. So it looks like a big group, Marie Kataini, uh, no Sabina Hausfurt, Lisa Risby. Okay, let's watch then for Hausfurt. And she was very close to the time of Lindbergh's at the, the uh, TV3, I think. Mm, the gap there was at TV3. Yeah. Yes, it so Bina Hausfurt was one second one slower second, than yeah. Lindbergh at TV3. Uh, but this actually looks like a really good finish from Hausfurt. So maybe it's going to take a new third fastest time here. Having caught up Lisa Risby, yesterday's bronze medalist. Good result here for the Swiss runner. Yeah, much faster finish here of Hauswehr compared to Lundberg. Maybe a bit due to the injury problems from Lundberg. She might not be ready 100% to perform uh, as she did earlier on the long distance. But still, of course, that's a very good result for both Hauswehr and Lundberg. So with Sabina Hausfit into third, Lisa Risby into fifth. It's still Elena Ross with the lead, but here's Andrina Benjaminson though. We can see she is on her way really, really shortly into the terrain and look at that gap over Elena Ross. It's mm. fantastic. And you can see that she's soon at the stream we were talking about earlier with Sabina there. We saw Sabina Hausfit in the picture. So this is only a few minutes left until 
she approaches to finish, maybe one or two. That's a good run by Andrina Benjaminsen. She's never won a World Cup before, World Cup race. No. Nope. Not an individual, at least. No, her best is, is second, as she was yesterday. She's also current silver medalist in the middle distance at the World Championships. She was fourth in the long distance last year in the Czech Republic. It will be very difficult for her to win this race today because I think that she, the runner in the picture, might be a little bit faster still. Yes, Simone Abersold did have the time advantage. It was one minute and 16 seconds at control number 23. And we can follow her here uh, on some of the later con couple of controls. I mean, it's not a very big margin, but still it's more than a minute. So there must be a mistake by Abersold in order to uh, open up for Benjaminson for the victory. Here she is in the Here's picture. Here's Benjaminson, and she's running for a top three, top two spot. Even, I think, here, the gap is big compared to that of Eleanor Ross, and she's done a fantastic job yet again, this terrain. She knows how to orienteer in this steep terrain in the complex contour section as well. And, oh, she's punching manually there. Uh, here gets the punch and she's going to cross this line to be a new leading time though mm. Andrina Benjaminson from Norway takes the lead and we've got about six minutes before we can see uh, if she beat, manages to beat Simone something Adsart. we can notice is that the gap between uh, it was still about still about three minutes yeah a bit faster Andrina Benjaminson in the last part here compared to Elena Ros and here we have the comparison between Rose and Alexanderson. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be tight. So can we spot Alexanderson? She maybe is looking for bronze medal spot here. She looked like she was slightly quicker than Eleanor Rose, but she's just, you can see her in the distance there, looking at her map. Maybe she's, she looks like she's quite off. Here's this oh, the runner doing a much better ah, job. That's Lina Strand. Lina Strand doing a much better job into this control uh, but Tove Alexanderson let's see if she can manage to get this one okay so we compare her time to Eleanor Ross yep there we go she's <laughs> just a few seconds ahead it's not much better Whoa, job there they were no. quite equal to this control but it's only two seconds between Alexanderson and the Ross so Alexanderson in bronze medal position, but only just. And, and now we wait for Abersold. So we're, they were live with Abersold in the synchronization to Benny Minson. Oh, she absolutely decks it uh, as she makes her way, I think, around to the go underneath the railway. Whoa. That's a big lead here. We can also tell you that Alex Anderson was about one minute faster between TV2 and TV3 compared to Elena Rose. Just, yeah, she has a good speed, that's for sure. Now let's take Abersold towards the finish here. You can see that she's dropping down to this railway line. You can see it in the background there. This We're going to have another, another look at the fall. Of course, the TV yeah. people, they enjoy this kind of pictures <laughs> here. Oof. It was not the toughest fall she's had no, in she her career. To, she manages to break that yeah. one quite well, I think. Impressive. So she's back underneath the, the um, railway line and down two more controls to go. And I think we will follow her this whole way as much as we can. And with the gap at TV3 was one minute and 16 seconds. So she has about two minutes left until she should be at the finish line. Yeah, you can see that the synchronized GPS looks really good. She's pretty much a whole control faster. Ahead, we've got the punch, I think, and very, very shortly we'll see her in to uh, take victory. Mm, I think it's fair to say that's not the most difficult part of the course left here. <laughs> so I think this is going to be another World Cup victory for Simona Abersold in a very short while. All eyes in this arena are looking towards the edge of the forest to see Simona Abersold. And 
and I'm sure there will be a lot of relief for her. This was, I think, towards control number 26. If I would guess. Maybe not. You can see how much it's tracking up. You can get a lot of feedback from some of the earlier runners expecting it to track up a lot. But here she is. Here's Simona Abersold. And the Swiss cowbells will start to chime because it's going to be a World Cup win, another World Cup win for Simona Abersold. She will just fight the last few meters, but there is no way that Tova Alexanderson can catch up this time. And a very good feedback for her on this long distance. It was all about not missing out on any of the route choices. Uh, there were no bigger mistakes. I mean, a small mistake there just before the second TV control, but otherwise uh, you could see that she pricked most of the route choices. And this is the difference between Alexanderson and Abersol today. Alexanderson missed one of the important route choices. Abersol didn't do that. No, Abersol had a pretty near flawless race. It looks like she was able to pick the right route choices, no major time losses, and rewarded with another World Cup win. What a way to round off the season here in Switzerland with a win for Simona Abersol and with those World Championships uh, in Flins and Locks next summer. It's already thumbs up from her before she'd even finished. Such is the performance there today from Simona Abersold. And what a performance from her. Congratulations from her teammates, from Andrina Benjaminson as well. So. There is only one runner left to finish. She gets the download, of course. And it's uh, quite a typical finish for this orienteering World Cup season this year. We have three runners in the top. It's, I would say it's the three runners we have seen the, during the last years perform best when it comes to when it comes to forest orienteering. Uh, today it was Simon Abersol's day. Then we have uh, most likely uh, Andrine Benjaminsen on second and Tuve Alexanderson on, on third. And those are the three runners we always have highest up on the list of the favourites. And they always perform very well. And yeah, there always seems to be a little bit of a kind of a gap back to the next best runners, which today mm -hmm. looks like Eleanor Ross. But let's have a look at the replay. Here we have this, a, so the leg, the leg replay. replay. So it's only this leg between 21 and 22. So we will going to get these differences where we have Alexander, uh, Benjaminsen and uh, Abersold going all the way around on the street there. We see that Alexanderson is looking for this re-entrant and a small path there, getting running parallel to the slope towards the control. And the others making a bit more of a safe route there. You can see that the difference is not very big. But of course, I mean, that's exactly the difference. Um, it's about 15 seconds faster, but there's a slightly higher risk. Um, in the end, I mean, if, if Alexanderson would not have missed that route choice, it could have been a decisive, decisive decision. You see another mistake here by Alexanderson getting too low in the slope there. But today it was paying off to take this safe route choice. And you can get the feeling that uh, if Alexanderson would have had a slightly different tactics today and not always go into the slopes, but decide to go around a little bit more, I'm quite sure she would have won this race. Yeah, I think so. And I think uh, I'm sure that's something that, that she will take into next races that she does in Switzerland, where it's this kind of terrain, um, because, yeah, that, that was a substantial time lost. It really, really was. And I mean, it's a difference between yesterday and today. Yesterday, you could go straight on every control, and it was always a valid option. Today it wasn't, so that one control, she went straight 
Uh, it, she should not have done that. No, no, and, and, and it goes back to being able to orienteer on all of these different types of terrain that kind of almost stitch together in this map uh, to, to, to have this course um, ultimately. And that's what I think the, the course planners have made sure that there's lots of different types of orienteering that this course is testing. And only if you do all of the bits right do you get somebody who's going to win. And Simona Abasov was able to do that. So we're going to see Tova Alexanderson in soon because I don't know if that mistake to control number 24 has affected uh, the race for the bronze medal here. Of course. Mm, I mean, the gap between uh, Elena Roos and Tove Alexanderson at TV3 was only two seconds. So they are still in the fight for this bronze medal spot here. Yeah, she should be in towards this finish really, really soon. So the mistake came after the TV control. So that's why I think there may well be advantage to Elena Ross here. And uh, talking about Elena Ross, she once more uh, proved that she is very well able to handle this alpine terrain. She performed super good five years ago when we had the last World Cup race in alpine terrain in Switzerland in Grindelwald. She won the long distance there, and today it seems that she will end up either on third or fourth position. Yeah, definitely one of one of her best uh, results. As you see, Marie Cataney in towards the finish. Some struggles for her, I think, around today's course, but she's such a quality forest orienteer. Maybe this isn't quite the terrain for her. So it will be 19th spot for Marie Cataney. Here we got another replay of this small mistake. She got too low into yeah. the slope there, about 15 meters. And interesting would be the comparison to yeah. Elena Roos, but of we course don't we don't want to take away the excitement here. Here she is in the picture. No, and you can see she's... Lena Strand was the other runner there, maybe didn't make that mistake yeah, we control saw that 24. Lena Strand and Tuve, they punched exactly at the mm -hmm. same time at the TV control, so for sure she lost quite a lot of time here. Here's the control, control number 27. And we will follow her on the back of the slope. So that was, a these pictures are from a few moments ago, but we can see it really clearly shows the time loss compared to Lena Strand. And that's from this mistake at 24, dropping too low, having to climb up about a good two, three, four contours. And then just, she always makes the forest running look so so easy. She's got to go underneath the railway line and we can wait for her at the finish. And look at that time compared to Eleanor Ross. It will be a bronze medal for the Swiss athlete and Alexanderson will be outside the top three. It was too big of a mistake there, just after the third TV control. Dropping too low in the slope, about 15 or 20 meters climbing. That really hurts in this kind of long distance. You drop too low and then you have to climb all the way back. This is Lina Strand, the runner we have seen punching at the same time as Tove Alexanderson at the third TV control. She most probably didn't do the mistake to was doing there. So it will be a top 10 finish for Lena Strand. Again, such a consistent runner and performer, but we will soon look back towards the forest again for Tova Alexanderson, who was only, it was definitely less than a minute behind uh, Lena Strand, I think. And we are ready to see her into the finish and the last control. Here she is. Tova Alexanderson with 17 world championship titles to her name. 
is she's going to be slower than Olausen in the end as well. But into fifth spot for her, and I'm sure there will be some learning points for her from today's long distance. And it was really the minutes and minutes of time that she lost on control number 12, sticking in the slope, not going up to the path and going round, choosing the shorter line that just absolutely ended her hopes of winning this last race of the season. But for Tova Alexanderson, she always bounces back from something like this. She's a big fan of the mountains. She will do some good uh, cross training, I think, over the winter. But it is fifth place for her. Six minutes and 14 seconds slower than today's winner, Simona Abbasalt. Today, there were just too many mistakes. Uh, first, this route choice mistake, and then the mistake in the very end. And of course, if no one of the other runners does anything wrong here on this course, then it's even for two Alexanders, and it's very tough to take the victory. It's quite an unusual picture to see her more than six minutes behind in a long distance. Yeah, normally Tova Alexanderson is able to catch up, you know, even from the mistakes that she makes, she's able to catch up time uh, and, you know, if, if not take the win, be, be very, very close to the lead after that. So I'm surprised to see Tova not be in even the top three here. But what a, yeah, exciting. I think I think the, those who have taken these top spots here, we've just seen pretty flawless races from them. Yeah, and I really like the kind of course because you have the dis different types of orienteering. We had a very decisive long route uh, that would, it would actually not have been so decisive if uh, Tove would not have done this big mistake on it because we have not seen anyone else doing it. But still, of course, you have to see the options and you have to choose the ones possible to execute more or less. Uh, we haven't seen so many big mistakes here. They, uh, I mean, yesterday we had many problems with directions into the control in the slope and we had kind of the same controls today, but the runners were well prepared and knew how to tackle them. We saw that they were saving up by going all the way around and taking the, the yellow lanes down to the control. So very well executed performances from those three runners here. Yeah, all those three top runners have shown fantastic orienteering. They deserve to be in the top. Elena Ross with the third place for her and that route choice. I think we, she was one of the few who did that route choice uh, towards uh, control number nine, taking the height. And I think that has just set her up for a fantastic last section as well. Andrina Benjaminson from Norway, two silver medals uh, in this terrain, the middle distance and the long distance. And for me, I, I feel like there's a win coming for her at some point. Not today, but her, her quality is so strong. But the biggest smile of the afternoon to win the last race of the World Cup season. What a great feeling that is to uh, head towards the winter and head towards a home world championships next year. Flawless orienteering from Simona Abersold and she is rewarded with that win here today. I know she was disappointed after the mistakes made at the end of yesterday's middle distance but she was able to quickly put that behind her and she's shown that she is more than a match and she's one of the best orienteers around right now. And you mentioned it before, it's just a matter of time until Benjamin will get her first World Cup victory. She's up there all the time and you kind of feel a bit a pity for her. It's a pity for her that she always has two of the runners. So it, if one of them is not having the best day, then the other one is taking over and having this. Uh, it's kind of, you get the same feeling as we had for Simona Abersold when it came to this individual title that yeah. If, if it's not two with then it's someone else who is just getting in front of her. And I have the same feeling for Benjaminsen that at one point she will get this World Cup title. Yeah, her orienteering quality is, is so strong and so consistent. And I 
think you know, she performed so well in, in the sprint orienteering, but I think it will come. I think it will come in the forest uh, for her. Well, an exciting uh, set of results and an exciting race in the women's class. Let's hear from the winner. Congratulations, Simona Ebersol. Tell us about your race. How was it out there today? Yeah, it didn't start real well. I already missed the first control. And then, yeah, the feeling was not that good. I also made a mistake to number six and then thought the whole time that two will come, two will come. And uh, she didn't. And then I heard at the passage that I was in the lead. So, yeah, it was just really tough. And uh, I fought until the end, until I just fell and fell over and over again because <laughs> my legs were so tired. But yeah, right now I'm just, just happy that it, went, it worked out so well. What was important today to do succeed in this race? I think it was important to keep the concentration like from the beginning to the end and to see all the important features and the slopes and to just decide uh, one route choice and then, then go and just push really hard and, and have fun out there. And it was really nice to rain. I enjoyed it until the end. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, you're definitely going to enjoy it if it ends with a win. But it's it's interesting to hear her say she just had to push and push and push because she could feel Tove Alexanderson breathing down her neck, you know, starting those three minutes behind. Maybe she expected to see her kind of coming behind her. And um, she managed to just, yeah, keep that race together. Even when she found out she was in the lead at the end, she was pushing so hard. She was, her legs were so tired, she was falling over, but she managed to make it work. I mean, it's, it's quite easy for her to say that it's, just just to enjoy the race we have a rather good race that's that's easier i think it's hard if she would have gotten stuck as to alexander in a slope she would have hard, had a hard time to enjoy the rest of the the course anyway if, even if she would have been fast so i think it's all a matter of the flow you get and maybe the feedback of course she talked about having mistakes in the beginning but then she also gets the feedback of other runners she she can catch uh, during the run and I think she got the feeling anyway that okay it's, it might have not been the best start but two is not coming and I'm getting into the flow anyway and I think uh, yeah it's good it's it's easy to enjoy when you have quite an okay race anyway yeah and actually it feels like not just today but over this long weekend we've seen a lot of heard a lot of people say they made some mistakes towards the beginning of the course and they actually kind of struggled to get into the map it took them a while but you know it, it's a different kind of terrain so they had to change the kind of terrain again and then it's a scale as well and you start in a downhill it's always very hard to start in a downhill because you don't really get the feeling for the distance you have to you, usually your legs are a bit faster than usually because there's no yeah i mean you, there's no effort in running and you have to just focus on the orienteer but maybe orienteering bit but maybe you're uh, full of adrenaline and uh, overpacing it a little bit so the first control often is quite difficult downhill in a new terrain with a new scale Yes, but uh, today, partly about this race, but partly about the overall World Cup title. Tova Alexanderson had decided it after yesterday's race, uh, but the victory overall here in 2022 over the races. If we look back, the sprints in Boros, the European Championships in Estonia, and then uh, these races in Switzerland over this weekend. It was Tova Alexanderson who came out top in all of them. <laughs> maybe not um, maybe not quite the end to the season that she wanted, but she ultimately comes out with another win on the World Cup circuit. The men's race, of course, has already been decided in terms of the, the World Cup overall with Kasper Fosser taking the win in that one again after his win on yesterday's middle distance. But let's hear from Tova. Congratulations to your overall win in the World Cup. How do you feel right now? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, from just to finish, so it's, yeah. Uh, I don't know, but I'm really happy with the, the overall win. Um, when looking forward to the World Championships next summer, it seems that this terrain suits you quite well. 
Yeah, I like this kind of terrain, so I'm looking forward to training uh, yeah, this kind of terrain. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Tova Alexanderson is not the easiest person to interview after she's not had a good run, uh, yeah, but, but clearly have, happy with the overall World Cup. You have to understand her. I mean, she's coming back from a tough long distance, yeah. and then you get this question. So you, you just heard <laughs> the winner of the race having an interview, got the flowers, and it's... I mean, she wants to win in every race, so I, I kind of like that with her because she is so genuinely into orienteering and has such a passion for the sport. So I, I, I like those up and downs in her mood as well. Yeah, she says it exactly as it is. Let's have a little recap then of the GPS tracking. Maybe we can have a look at maybe some of those mistakes. I mean, I mean they were talking. The start. All of them were talking about mistakes, but they are hard to see. I th in the beginning, I think there's yeah, the feeling is not good if you miss by a few seconds in the beginning. But it's they, those were not the mistakes that decided the race. Interesting here that both Elena Rose and Andrina Benjaminsen uh, they went more to the west there around this out of bounds area and i think it was a very good decision it might be the place where elena rose was able to save her place on the podium today and this here the, uh, maybe the decisive part today because we saw that Tuve alexanderson was going into the slope trying to get through those uh, cl uh, cliffs and rocks there and lost a lot of time uh, around four minutes then we got into this section here, runnability a bit less good. We saw many runners struggling a little bit, losing time, hesitating into the controls, 17 and 18. Uh, then the route choice, 21, 22. We have seen before the analysis, Abersold and Benjaminsen going all the way around. Was a quite an okay option, maybe a few seconds slower than the one straight, but for sure easier to execute. And uh, of course, you, we compared it to Tuve Alexanderson, uh, who went straight there. Then this last part where we heard Simone Abersol telling that she was very tired, and we saw her in the picture as well that she was falling every now and then. Uh, but those three, the three medalists of today's women's race. So that is how it was won. And we go towards the men's race now. And they've been out in the forest, a lot of the men already for a long time. We will catch up with what's been happening for them. Much earlier this morning, they checked into the quarantine. That is Casper Fosser, the Hubman brothers there as well. Daniel Hubman's had a great, great uh, championships. Can Joey Haddon do something if he gets it right today? Ruslan Glebov as well. And they've been hanging out in that, um, in that sports hall for a while before taking the cable car up to the start. They'll have maybe been trying to, I think even from the cable car, you can see some of the runners starting. So that's quite interesting. They'll already have their minds ticking over what the course could be like from there. Trying to relax as much as possible, trying to get the muscles ready to go and ready to cope for this long, long race. The starting order will be that of the World Cup points. There's Max Petabema. And the course today for the men, 14.4 kilometers. Look at the climb, 635 meters. The winning time, 90 minutes. It's going to be a long old slog out there, but really those they will fill every single meter of those 635 meters of climb. Let's have a look at where it comes in the course and what challenges they can expect. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it's the same start as in the women's race, and then it's a longer loop here in the beginning, so they go further away from the start. Uh, have a few controls here in this slope. It's kind of downhill orienteering in the very beginning. Then you run up again towards control five, six and seven, and then you have the same all over again with the downhill orienteering towards control 11, 12. Then you're not going back. Uh, oh yeah, you're going back away from the finish again uh, to another short loop, 13, 14, 15. And from there, they will have a long leg here towards control 16. Uh, 
I've been looking at this route. I think that most of the runners will just go down straight from the control to this street and run all the way around. But let's see. Uh, that's just my feeling. We'll see how they choose. Uh, control 17, then the first TV control. It's the same control as we had in the women's race. So then we have this 1819. That's the control where to where Alexanderson lost the race when she was deciding to go into that valley. 21 and then 22. 23, 24, 25, it's this section again where the terrain shifts and it gets a bit more uh, vegetation on the ground, uh, hard runnability and we have seen a lot of hesitating in the women's race there between control 23 and 25. Then we go to 27 and 28 and then the climbing, uh, the same climbing as yesterday more or less towards 29. It's another. It's also here a uh, long lap but it's not exactly the same control as in the women's race. TV3 then at control 30. And then from control 30 the runners they will go down here towards the arena and have as well a short loop here and the in the very end, so a short loop even for the men towards the finish. But I think uh, there shouldn't be any problems on this short loop here, technically. It's a long course, um, it's a lot of climbing, it's a lot of slope orienteering. It will be tough for the runners, we'll have the same kind of differences in terrain, but the difference between the men's and the women's race is that you have a bigger part of the race in these slopes, in this very typical alpine terrain, very, very steep orienteering. You have to be sure you're on the right height when you get to the control, otherwise you can yeah, lose time there in the slopes. And we saw that benefit Simona Abersold on the women's race. Who do you think can take advantage of, of this kind of terrain for the men? Well, I mean, Physically, I think that Shoei Hadon has everything you need to win this race. Uh, it's just about the technique there. Sometimes he has a few controls every course where he struggles. If he can keep that to a minimum today, then he is one of the favorites for me. Daniel Hoopman looked really strong throughout uh, the whole weekend. Uh, so those are the two Swiss runners I would like to highlight because yeah, it's kind of today it's more of an advantage to be on home soil. Then of course Kasper Fosser, uh, the favorite because he is the World Cup winner. But here in the picture, one of my favorites because he performed so well this weekend, Daniel Hoopman. Yeah, I think he could really do something quite exciting here. He knows how to perform on this. He's 28 mm. walk medals. And to especially, his name. I mean, this terrain, you have an advantage if you're an experienced runner mm. because you have had decisions like those before and you might have learned from your mistake, mistakes earlier. So I think it's not a disadvantage to have been within the orienteering circus for a few years. <laughs> More than a few years for <laughs> Daniel Hoopman, age 39. Uh, he knows how to compete on this kind of uh, level. Mika Kimmela, he is, was next to start for Finland. He was actually third in the, the Swiss long distance champs. Quite a few international runners came and, and competed there. And he was one of those uh, who did really, really well uh, on, in that race. We'll sure have given him lots of confidence. As we saw, uh, Simon Mark is the current leader at the finish. And let's compare him to Joey Haddon. It's kind of the answer to my <laughs> statement before. I think Joey Haddon would have needed a bit more of an advantage here in this very steep sec section in order to be one of the big favorites for the race, uh, in order to be able to win it today. So interesting, uh, Simon Mark is the leader in the finish. Uh, we have had Isaac von Cruz and Juana with good times at all, almost all, uh, display times here before. Yeah, he may will be the, the, the one to take over the leader's chair, but back at the start, Oli Oyenho has really had a breakthrough season this season. His fourth position yesterday was his best senior result. Just fixing his hair there. <laughs> <the start. laughs> but he was sixth. I mean, he's on TV. That has to be a 
This is a, yeah. it's an important pre-race um, routine just of to kind of kind of get set and get ready. That's the cable car they took up to the uh, scenery the start. behind. And a very different picture to what it looked like at the start of, where, of when we were broadcasting the women's race, where it was the cloud was down. You can see we're, we're up in the mountains, we're up in the clouds here. And that altitude, I mean, we haven't really talked about the altitude today. It is making a difference to, you know, the way people feel, although hopefully, you know, even those who've only arrived, you know, a day before, a couple of days before the competition, starting to adapt to it. But it still makes you feel rubbish when you're trying to do a climb in that altitude. I mean, the, the thing is, I don't think that you as a runner feel, get directly the feeling that the altitude is a problem, but it m might make you feel that you don't feel so strong that day. So, uh, but was, as one of the runners said, uh, quite good this week is like running fast is always feeling shit. Like you always feel bad when you run fast, so it, no matter if it's in high altitude or not, it's. I think it just lowers your level a little bit, and you feel, of course, tired. But it's it's you have a bad feeling as well when you run. <laughs> yeah, and anywhere else, more or less. So Oli Oyanho, the Finn, on his way now. Only a few to start after him, and um, yeah, I think. It could be an opportunity for him to get another top 10, top six results. But back into the forest, here's Joey Haddon, and he's at control number 25. So we can maybe take a, take a time check compared mm -hmm. to that of, uh, well, Simon Newark, who's our current position. leader, and also Isaac von Krusenfeuerne as well. So he's into third place. Yeah, 54 seconds behind the leader, Isaac von Krusenfeuerne, but haven't had Isaac to the finish yet. Joey Haddon's definitely got, not got very many World Cup points or world ranking points because I think he's starting fairly early on from maybe what I would expect. But kind of we know for Joey that things can either go really well, he can win World Cup middle distances, he's won two of them, or things can all kind of unravel quite quickly. Yeah, and here we have him, Isaac von Kruse, we were talking about him before. Now on the way, there's a small mistake at control 35. That's unexpected. I mean, there should be a few tracks to this control already. And I think he missed about 20, 30 seconds there. Quite unnecessary. Now it's going to be tight between him and uh, Simon Imark. You can see it. The dots are almost exactly at the same place. I think it might be even a small advantage for Imark, but let's see here. It's going to be really oh, tight. This is going to be really tight. Oh, this looked like he may have taken over the lead, but maybe not here. Mm, and that it's control, running time is running out. At TV control three, uh, he had an advantage of almost one and a half minutes, so he lost time for sure in the end here. It's not going to be D Mark, but he will be. In we will go into second position. He was in the lead at all of the split times and he's still leading all of the split times here. Well, that sometimes can be the, the, the toughest feeling when you lose just a little bit right at the end when most of the race has gone so well. But back at the start, for Eskil Shinneberry, he is a silver medalist from the European Champs long distance, uh, but was only managed 31st yesterday. Things didn't quite go so well for him. Maybe a little bit better at that long distance compared to the middle distance, and the, maybe the different varieties of terrain will suit him. Immediately folding up that map, getting that smaller viewing point as he sees the first part of the course. Okay, let's take a look at this long mm -hmm. route and choice. And we have now some of the different options here. I would expect them to even go right to the north, down on the higher, not, yeah, right to the north, down to the street there, all the way around. 
they decide to go more the middle way. It's quite a big climb there for Martin Hoopman, so you can see that Simon Imark might have an advantage. Of course, he has the climbing there at the very end. That looks, that looks much better, much Big stronger, compare, I think. Uh, E-Mark and Hoopman, the gap at the control before was 2 minutes and 16. The next control, it is uh, quite exactly 3 minutes. So about 45 seconds he lost there, Martin Hoopman. Would be interesting to compare also to this other route choice all yeah, the, the way around. Yeah, the red route choice that drops directly down onto that wide track. It's a, it's a forest road. There's a, you know, a lot of just just road running you can go down. If Matthias Kibbert was running uh, this race, we know which one he'd take. He'd definitely take that one, surely. Yeah. But out with that foot injury, he'd have been uh, probably a favourite, the, the favourite for today's uh, long distance race if he was running. Uh, so unfortunately for, for the sport of orienteering, he's been hobbling around on crutches this weekend. I think it was um, a sad but easy decision to miss this World Cup. It was clear enough to not struggle with the decision at least, mm. so he, there was no chance that he could run today. You can see here that E-Mark is glued to the red line, to this control 29. There's no going around for him there at all. Andreas Solberg from Norway as well. Taking the same route there towards control 29, getting up to this small hill there and attacking the control from the north. But it's uh, becoming a glorious afternoon at this arena for all the runners to finish their 14.4 kilometer course. Here's Tim Robertson though, and Tim Robertson best known as a sprint orienteer. He's got two medals at Sprint World Championships. It didn't go well for him this summer, but I love the fact that he, he also races in the forest yeah, as well. Yeah, I mean, he can't get further away from sprint orienteering no. than this. <laughs> you really can't. It's a completely different skill. Um, but of course, he's because of the World uh, Cup points, he starts quite near the end of the race. And we will... There'll only be four more runners after him as well. And I'm joined uh, in the commentary box by Isaac from Cruising Planner, who's just come into uh, second place uh, here at the finish. We could see that he was leading uh, a long way um, around the course, but kind of things things went a little bit wrong at the end. Why don't you talk us through uh, the course itself, how you found it, um, and that long leg as well? Yeah, I, yeah it was uh, quite a tricky beginning of the course and a lot of downhill control, so I took it very easy and tried to yeah, uh, t uh, just focus on the technique. And yeah, I got the first 15 controls uh, very good, and then uh, that was the long leg, and I decided to try to run along the path uh, uh, on the right. Uh, yeah, Did you drop straight. all the way down? No, uh, no, past I, I, went, uh, I went up. You went up, yeah. okay. Uh, it was really oh, yeah, tough. Quite straight, uh, yeah. yeah, it was really tough in the beginning, but then I. Yeah, it's a pretty nice way down to the control, and I had to, it's hard to evaluate right now which <laughs> yeah. was the quickest. But yeah. I, I found it quite good. Yeah, uh, and then and then the course changed a lot of the characteristics. You changed from the slope, you changed to some of the more intricate contours. We can see on the TV coverage the the undergrowth gets right. a bit different. How did you cope with the, the different types of terrain in, in here? Yeah, I found it very challenging when we uh, changed just uh, that much, but. Uh, yeah, I managed to keep it together almost all the way and <laughs> made a one minute mistake and then, which, yeah, it's a little bit sad right now, but I think I will be quite satisfied tomorrow anyway, so. And obviously it's only just after you finished your race, but from, from this and the whole weekend, what can you take forwards to like next year when we have a big forest focus? Uh, it's a lot of experience just running these uh, tough long distances here in Switzerland. It's always tough, but uh, yeah, you, now I know what I need to work on and uh, yeah, go home to Sweden and run in some more uphills and downhills. <laughs> yes, I, ev that will be on everybody's list for this winter. Lots of uphills and lots of downhills. Good luck with your winter training. Thank you so much for chatting us through your course. And uh, we will go back to the start line now for Emil Svensk.
and he ended up with the fifth place after yesterday's uh, middle distance. He is the European Sprint Champion. Many, many top six results. Is this a day that he can put in another good performance, get another top six maybe? And there are only four more men after him. So maybe Emil Svensk looking to pick up some good World Cup points, take some uh, good results and get a good position in those overall World Cup rankings. But fairly straight down into the first re-entrant for the first control. Let's have a little look here. So there was the mistake from uh, Isaac von Krusenfein and ultimately that's second place for him. Yeah. It looks like we're looking for Wojtek Kral next He's from the Czech Republic. The slope a bit early there as well. Not perfect, executed towards control 33. But now on the way to control 35 and soon to the finish. Uh, Wojtek Kral was in sixth position at TV3. About six minutes and 20 seconds behind. You can see he's stuck on the track a long way to get into that control, maybe trying to avoid the green, the small green section, and just kind of maybe keeping with that the trend of people playing it safe on those last few controls. Okay, back at the start, here's Gustav Bergman, who I think was, was not too dissatisfied with his race yesterday, that middle distance where he was eighth. Wants to try and uh, see what he can do on this long distance. He was, uh, was so impressed with what the others can do, could do in those Swiss long distance championships, which was won by Matthias Kiewerts and just, I think, wants to try and put together a, a performance he's happy with. He's, he's often he's his own worst critic, so um, we'll see what happens. Uh, this, this is Wojtek Kral, by the way, mm, not, not so Andreas Silbo. On the way to the finish. Wojtek Kral is, again, probably better known as a sprint orienteer, but here performing well in the forest that's not his time we're looking at so he will go into uh seventh place i think yeah six minutes and ten seconds behind the leader simon e mark some activation looks like he's got a, a kind of some sort of soundtrack in his um <laughs> in his he's mind feeling, there he's feeling the beat at yeah least. he really is um yeah he's he said he's got a Recurring back injury has Gustav Bergman, but it looks so he kind of that was his reason for not running the relay. We'll see how he's able to do here. Immediately takes the map, takes a look, tries to take a look at the first couple of controls. I mean, if you struggle with back pain, this race <sighs> is going to be horrible, but let's see. Drops quite quickly down the slope. And you've got to use all the core strength to, to stay upright in this terrain and, and get that power off those slopes. But here is um, some pictures from earlier of the last starter today, Casper Fosser, winner of yesterday's middle distance. And for me, the big favorite, he is the world champion in the long distance. I remember his his medal winning performance in Norway 2019 where really his focus for that season was the junior world championships he came in quite last minute into the Norwegian team and did such a good job and uh, let's compare again three of the runners on this route choice here we have Simon Imark, Isaac von Krusenkwena and Joey Hadorn yeah Isaac said he kind of stuck in the sh in the in the height and, and took a more direct line he said it was good to go down into that control but mm. oh and then Joey had on kind of changes his mind yeah mid he, mid leg he, I think he noticed that if he has if he stays on this path there he will go down all the way around again has to do the climbing anyway in the end uh, the route here from uh, from Cruz and Quena was quite good compared to the other ones it was faster then E Mark in this bit. Could reclaim the lead there. 
Joey had only started 45 seconds behind the mark and punched then 24 seconds behind uh, Van Cruz and Stjärna. And he started ahead of Van Cruz and Stjärna. So uh, well, sure Van Cruz and Stjärna, the, the fastest of those three on this leg there. I'm sure we'll get lots of analysis kind of later on so. or after the today's race about what was the best thing to, to do on that long leg because it's really not clear, I think. But Martin Regborn is the next to start European champion in the long distance. But back towards the finish, this is Andreas Solberg. And he must have made a mistake, I think, here. Maybe he was slightly higher up. Um, but the Norwegian is now in running to try and make a top 10. Don't have his time at the uh, third TV control. Don't have that split times for him. But he's in the finish into eighth position, shared. No, eighth position. Yep, ahead of Frederic Tronchon. Back to the start low, though. Let's see the European long distance champion, Martin Regborn, seventh yesterday. And let's. He may be more suited to that long distance. You can see just how, how small he's folded the top bit of the map up to get a really good and, and direct start to control number one. We can remember his performance at the European Champs when he actually was one of the runners who didn't cross uh, the river there and still got in touch directly again and kind of reclaimed the lead there. Very, very good performance. This long distance there. And here we have a comparison between Van Cruz and Kuerna, Hadon and Imark. Now, this is very interesting. I think we last saw um, Joey Hadorn kind of earlier at the earlier TV control number two. Yeah, there two. is just behind Imark. We saw him at control number 25. I think he was just under a minute slower than uh, Von Cruz and Fuena there and Imark. So well, was 54 seconds behind. So obviously we've lost his kind of GPS tracker in the slope here, but I think we'll very, very shortly see him. But let's head back to the start. This is the final starter for today. This is, of course, Casper Fossa. Mm, and you mentioned it before, very, very strong in long distances already was yeah, the shooting star at the, Europe, at the World Championships 2019 when we totally unexpectedly got into the fight for the victory together with Olaf Lundanes there. And then uh, last year at the World Championships, just outstanding. We outclassed everyone else and kind of was able to catch Matthias Kibbutz after a few minutes of running already. And then had a whole train behind him with all the medalists. And how unusual is that for someone to break into, especially winning <laughs> long distances, this young? I mean, it's very unusual. We haven't seen that very often. Uh, yeah, to, to take the step from the juniors to the, yeah, to the to this kind of the, the let's say the real world championships and the World Cup is often quite tough. And many of the runners take first step in sprint orienteering then maybe middle distance and last step is in, in long distance. But he kind of just got into it. That's the same as Hannah Lundberg in, in the women's class. And that's very, very impressive. Here we are with Joey Hadorn and it seems that he Yeah, the is... fact that he was climbing suggests yeah. something even yeah, more is fact, going wrong. The fact that he is going from the right to the left in the picture here and back to the right is showing that he's not really... I don't know that In he's control. got control number 29 yet. Ah, here uh, we now go. he's got it. But for sure he lost time here again. Oh, there we go. Can just tell how he's relying on looking over his shoulder. He has to go another there. control. Yeah. So he lost quite a lot of time. I mean, he was. 
Did you say 54 seconds behind Isaac van Cruz and Cuerna at the second TV control? It's I definitely mean, more now. Really, he should kind of contour into that control. You shouldn't be losing or gaining height. I think from the direction he was going into that control 29, the fact that he was, as when we first saw him on picture, he was climbing, uh, immediately kind of says something is wrong. He's not quite got the position on the slope, which is a bit of a shame. You can see just the small rocks and things on this slope. You can see that he's trying to find kind of a good track to get down, but already now you can feel that he kind of loses contact again. He should be very careful in this bit, and he should know that from yesterday. It just feels like he's he's trying to change direction, that his, his compass work wasn't strong enough it to feels, take him direct. To me, it feels as if he's stressed by the cameraman behind him. I mean, who wouldn't be? I mean, many other of the runners, they are not stressed at all. I think more... I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, he, he didn't have the best season this year. Maybe he's lacking a bit of self-confidence. And then, of course, when you just did a mistake and you know you, everyone could see it and then there's another cameraman following you to the next control and you start to get a little bit of direction, that's not an easy situation. But, he, I mean... We have that in every World Cup race, so they, it's just you have no other choice. You have to get used to it. Yeah. You can just see the way he's looking around here, looking in all directions, trying to spot some features that can be helpful, that can be useful. And again, this, this whole section is that when you lose your map contact, it's so hard to get it back. Mm. So into third position, two minutes and five seconds behind. So we lost about one minute and ten seconds compared to the second TV control. But Casper Fossa out into the terrain. He's already won the World Cup overall. But of course he will want to go out of this season with a bang, with a win, of course. And he's somebody who, I mean, we if you remember back to the sprints in Barros when he really wasn't that fit, he'd had a big injury, he really struggled and he really pushed himself. Now, this is very interesting because this is not quite the control I think we saw in the women's. It's a little bit longer, but... Imark is doing almost exactly the same as uh, Tuve did. Maybe a bit smarter to fall down a bit more. Tuve was a bit higher up there in the steepest part. But still, I mean, it's both... It's running in a very, very steep slope and then also um, parallel to the slope. You have to get the control from there. That's not too easy. Um, so I am i don't think this is the best decision. But Simon Mark still the current leader. He's been sat in I mean, that chair for a while. He, he, I have to say, he executed it really well mm. uh, doing this, but it's... Uh, you would, even if it's as fast as going around then I think it's not the best option because you get so much time going around preparing other controls and you got so much time you can relax more you need much more energy to run parallel to the slope there so I'm not really convinced about this route there I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised that no one is taking the red route here or even more extreme just go north down to the street but I mean we have seen that from Cruz and Juana was quite good here on this leg. And we also have uh, Viktor Svensk here. Same route as Imark. Ah, changing strategy there in the very end. Yeah, wanting to climb um, the I track. I think that Imark's option is more straight, it's shorter, and you don't save any climbing. Of course, the, the difference is that he, uh, Svensk can do the climbing on a path, which is often quite good to do. It's interesting to see here. Yeah, but it's only a, really a small part on the path if you take that direction. Mm, but I mean, it's almost 25 meters to climb you can take there, but I still think that the Mark yeah. has a better option there. 
small, small mistake by Van Chris and Quen as well. Got a bit high in the slope there, had to go back again. Yeah, I see potential for improvement, I think, from some of the later runners if they manage to get all those things I mean, right. Van Chris and Quen's mistake was not many seconds. That's um, talking about 10 seconds or something, so that's still okay. So dropping down towards control 25, Martin Hibben. He's actually living in Davos at the moment in order to prepare for next year. Yeah, did you just move there? Yeah. Just move here? Martin Hoopman will go sick. Mm, lost uh, almost exactly one minute from the first TV control to the second TV control. Here we are waiting at the first TV control, I think, for Viktor Svensk. Yep, we will watch him to this climb up to he started, what for the men is the 17th control. He started 18 seconds behind Simon Mark at the control before. So it was a faster way for Simon Mark to go more straight up there. And for Viktor Svensk, it's his first year as a senior. So a young runner with... Uh, ah, that doesn't look good. Lucas ah. Lina definitely got some pain there. Yep. I wonder ah. if that will be a retirement for him. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. I hope it's a nothing shame for serious. him because he was fourth at the Swiss Long Distance Championships, age just 23. So um, that'll be the end of and his race. We could follow him yesterday for quite a long time. Performed quite well uh, in yeah, yeah, quite, he was a, for quite a long time. And then he had this mistake we could see in the picture as well. So yes, for sure, potential in this terrain. This, I think, is Mathieu Perrin. It is Mathieu Perrin. He took two bronze medals at the World University Championships held in the northern part of Switzerland. But you can see his time more than five minutes off the pace at the mm. moment. He started three minutes 26 behind at the control before. So he's losing a lot of time on this route choice. Yeah, and in fact, um, Victor Svensk, who we saw just now at this control, started after him, so he's already been overtaken by the Swede. Here he is in the picture, Mathieu Perrin. Punching there into 22nd position. Just about two minutes or more. Now let's have a look again at this route choice we can compare to Thomas Krivda. Yeah, choosing to go more straight up the hill there. Uh, losing a lot of time here, just exiting the control. But going uh, almost the same then later on, of course, on this path. Here he is. Yeah, much better into the control itself, I think. Started. And just, just checking the route into the next control, maybe checking the compass as well. Started one minute and 48 seconds behind. Might be about the same, maybe a bit faster now, or a bit closer to the leader. I think the leader at this point still uh, is Isaac von Krusenfreiner. Yes, indeed. And here's Thomas Krivda. Mm -hmm. There into fifth position, one minute and 11 seconds behind. Mm -hmm. 
Here we know uh, Max Peter Beimer as well on this route. Climbing a lot immediately out of the control. Yeah, getting to the street a bit earlier compared to Van Cruz and Juana. But very, very equal on this route here. You can see it, uh, they will approach almost at the same time there. So could this be a new fastest time here then actually yeah, at this point? It was he's up from Chris and Fuena who was fastest and now Max Peter Beamer looks like maybe he's done a better job. There's Magnadeli as well. There is Magnadeli who has not had a good start at all. He started a good few people before oh, yeah. Max Peter Beamer who is actually... He looked minutes. like he had a bit of a nightmare yesterday, 49th, and this is much better for uh, Beamer. Uh, you can see it will be quite close between Van Cruz and Juan and Max Peter Beimer. We'll see them climb beyond these trees. Triple Swedish lead here at the first TV control. Uh, here they are. Ah, that's really tough for Magnadali. I mean, it's still early in the competition and already got the feedback that he has lost a lot of time here. This is Joey Haddon on the last meters towards the finish. Yep, Joey Haddon here. And it felt again, you know, just a few mistakes that cost him large amounts of time, but the speed was there. Nevertheless, he will go into third place. And it'll be a minute and a half slower than Simon and Mark, who still sits in the leader's chair. Yeah, Max Padabema, by the way, has caught up 12 minutes on mm -hmm. Magna Daily. That's a lot. Doesn't seem to be very satisfied. You can see maybe some problems there. Very tired yeah. leg at least. Supporting the step with the hand. Trying to save some energy in the legs. The Swiss team do their regular time trial on the track as part of their selection uh, races. And Jerry Haddon always performs well on that. We know he's got the speed. Uh, it's just sometimes too quick for his navigation. This is the leg replay between Control 28 and 29. We have uh, Jonas Soldini, Simon Mark, Isaac van Cruz and Kuena and Jerry Haddon. Till here, there are almost all of them at the same route. You can see that Van Kruisenkana now is going towards the blue option. All the others seem to stay on the red option. There's this small track you can use. It's the same one they could use yesterday. Now you can see that Hadon was Dropping quite a bit. That's where we saw him in the picture now climbing up the hill there That's too early doing the mistake. Yeah. You can also see that uh, Soldini. Good. Quite a fast section here between 28 and 29. Not really satisfied with his race. Joey Hadon. A great race on Saturday in the relay, the last leg. And he was just climbing. One minute faster than everyone else, <laughs> up the almost 150 meters to climb. So Simon Imark still, still, still sits there in the leader's chair. Luckily, it's warmed up a bit this afternoon, so it's quite, quite a nice position to be in. You can relish every second of that here with, I mean, one of the best views in orienteering. I mean, you gotta, can't lie. But of course, we finished with those who've got the best, the most World Cup points. So I think we'll start to see people like Daniel Hubman and, and others later on. Oli Oyanaho, maybe. Emil Svensk, we'll see what they can do. So we're at the top 10 here. 
at the finish. Still double Swedish in the lead. Simon Niemark in front of Isaac van Kruisenkwerna. Simon Niemark sitting here in the leader's chair. Okay, let's head back to the forest. I was going to say, is that a Latvian shirt? Rudolf Cernis here. So replay. Rude choice replay, leg replay to, from 12 to 13. They are all heading towards this open yellow bit where they are now. I mean, the, it's quite good exit there. You can just keep on the height, stay there, take the track out. Now they fall down towards this 13th control. You got this, those streams there that help you with the distance. Uh, there shouldn't be many problems with this control. We have the green area just behind the control that help you in order to not overshoot the control. But Emil Svensk is the one that's overshot it. Yeah, got down a little bit too much into the valley there. It shouldn't really happen. I mean, uh, you, if you have control over the compass there you can just uh, check the direction of the hill of course it's turning it's not too easy but you got the stream as well that helps you towards the control then you got the stones just before the control as an attack point as well and now we see Florian Howald on the way to the 22nd control, but he's quite far behind. Didn't feel so good on the relay day. Had very heavy legs there after problems having Corona and then coming back and still not feeling up 100%, especially when he has to push very hard. No, so I think we'll see him next at control 24 and 25. <laughs> So let's see if we can pick up Florian Hovald. Here he is. Look at the time gap at the moment. Right, it seems to be a current top 10 position for him. He was 21st in yesterday's middle. Approaching this control here. Starting to look around. Trying yeah. to get the features on the way to the control. Has to yeah. climb a little bit. Here's the control. And you can see that he was looking up a lot, like the proportion of map reading to looking up at, into that control was really wanting to just focus on, on getting that and now manages to get a little bit more uh, speed. And you can see that there's it's already tracked up quite a lot there. But you may be thrown over leaving that track, heading over into control number 25. Again, a quite a different and distinctive part of the course. Again, just pausing slightly. Cool, and as we uh, watch Florian Hovald into this uh, control, he goes into ninth spot, so still top 10 there at control number 25. We've got Joe Haddon joined us in the commentary box. I've just put a map in front of him and he's already grabbed it to kind of have a look at uh, what happens uh, on the course. Um, it looked like you had a high, quite a high speed, but quite a few mistakes on your course today. Is that fair? 
Yeah, I'm happy I didn't had a, a big mistake or yeah, a big time loss. Yeah, I realized that I had sometimes um, some hesitations, especially when the camera was around, I think. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the legs were after the two races now pretty heavy. Wasn't as great as yesterday. And the end it began a bit to cramp in, uh, in the calves. But yeah, on the long distance, you're happy when you finish with a, without a big time loss. Yeah, yeah, we can really see that. As um, Tell us about the, the long leg that you did. Which, which way did you go and, and why did you make that choice? Yeah, I was to, together with uh, the Austrian guy uh, to number 16. So I was, wasn't really sure which route to take. I, I, I t looked a lo long time on the map. So he suddenly began to climb, and I thought, yeah, it's 75 meters dropping down. The other route is also a bit dropping down and getting a long way around. I don't know. So it will be interesting what is faster. Yeah, I think we don't quite know yet which is faster. I think there, there, there's some micro route choices in there that will make a little bit of a difference, but I think it's still, once we see some of the later runners, we'll get more of an indication as to which one of those is quicker. Um, but I also want to ask you one quick question about the, the relay, because you really made it for the, the Swiss team in the relay. We saw you kind of catch up on that the long uphill climb. What was going through your mind there? Well, yeah, I started a bit behind. Uh, I was the first time in Swiss 1, but uh, we were last going out on the third leg. So then I made a f few little hesitations there in the first controls, and suddenly I had no one in front of me. And then I knew, ah, uh, now it's really the time to to put uh, the gas down and uh, catch as much as possible on the uphill. And when I was down, I, I didn't saw anyone. But uh, when I looked up, in uh, when I was on the top, I saw everybody. So yeah, it was great to to be again there in the game. And I think it was a big motivation. And maybe I a little overpaced a little bit at that day. But yeah, it was nice to get the victory in the relay. Yeah, yeah, it re it, we could see that that climb, particularly and that speed there, really made a difference for the team. And then uh, you can now go and rest your legs a little bit for after this race and try and um, get some good winters training in, I guess, ahead of the next year's World Championships, which I assume will be an aim for you. Yeah, of course. I think, uh, yeah, there's still work to do, but I'm looking forward uh, to train a more in this beautiful terrain and uh, yeah, it will be easy to be motivated through all the, the whole winter. Yeah, good luck with your winter's training. Thanks, Joe, for having the chat to us. And uh, we will head back to the race because here is Daniel Hubman on this descent. This must be the end of the long leg, I think. So it looks like he will have climbed up. Uh, and it looking good here. Well, no, Daniel Hubman's still got another control left to go. Uh, and we will see whether he's able to match the time of Max Petterbema, who's currently leading at this control number uh, 17. That was number 16. Mm, Hopeman started to this control, 128 behind. You can see that uh, he went this same option as Van Krusenkwerna. Very fast there in this last downhill towards the control. And now the climb comes here and he is close to Imark, who is our current leader, still the leader. But maybe if well, you think, think about the runners to come we later. We have Max Peter as, as the leader there. Oh, but Imark so is Imark the leader at the finish. Oh, yeah, yeah, at the finish, yeah. But maybe with the, the caliber of runners to come, maybe if Daniel Hoodman was challenging for another podium position, would you maybe think he should be a little bit quicker than that? I don't know. I mean, it's hard he's, to tell. Quite, he's quite far behind that control 15 just before this long leg here. He's 128 behind, and I think that's quite a big gap. But uh, let's see. I mean, it seems as if he had a good route there towards control 16. Brought him back. Quite close to the leaders, to Max Peter Beimer. Only 23 seconds behind. And here we are with Martin Hoopman towards control 29. At the second TV control, Martin was in sixth position, four minutes and 17 behind. Is a conclusion for now. So he 
lost a little bit more here. Quite good control taking here. Just one more control to go until the TV control three. And I guess he heads back out to the open track there. The kind of long line of open, and we'll see him. There we go, he crosses through this terrain. Dropping down by the stones. A much better control of this situation compared to Joey Haddon. It was interesting to hear Joey say that he didn't think there were too many big time losses. <laughs> there were lots of small ones there, yeah. I think. And he noticed himself as well that uh, often when the camera was around that he did the mm -hmm. mistakes then. So he definitely noticed the cameras. Yeah, yes, he really did. Uh, it's hard not to, and it's hard not to get yeah, completely course. put it's off by them It's very strange well. when you have someone running close to you and following every step you do. I mean, you're used to run with other competitors, but they don't follow you no. all the time, no matter what you do. Of course, they do. Uh, they they re usually read the map as well and take own decisions. But if you have a cameraman, he will just follow you every step you take. So next up, we're looking for Victor Svensk then into control number 25. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, top six performance from him yesterday. And it looks like another very mature performance again today. Mm -hmm. He was at the uh, first TV control. He was at the sixth position again. One minute and three seconds behind uh, Max Peter Bamer then. There he is, into fourth place now. Mm -hmm. And we could see, for example, the replay of the control into 13, that, you know, he just was uh, executing that uh, incredibly well. That is um, Yannick Michels just punching there as well. Walk sprint bronze medalist. He was incredibly happy to, to finally take a medal at the World Championship Sprint, but taking the climb here. It's Anton Johansson, I guess. Yes, indeed. Yep, the... Ah, but this looks, he already here, looks very tired. Yeah. Ah, this is going to be a tough journey for him, I guess. He will be happy when he can go into the next downhill part. This is Kirmula. Yeah, Kirmula. This looks much faster if you compare him uh, with Anton Johansson. And he started six minutes after Anton Johansson yeah, yeah. is already overtaking him. You can, you can him. feel this it is just really seeing nice. the pictures. That's not Oya now, I think it was Kimmela. No, Kimula. I think it was Kimmela, you're Kimula right. Kimmela punched into eighth position, 134 behind. Let's see what he did on the long leg. Kimmela, third place at the Swiss Long Distance Championships. He was 39th yesterday. Let's have a look at the he comparisons. Was, he was uh, 245 behind at the control before. And now it's only 134, of course, it's compared to uh, first e -Mark and then Max Peter Beimer. So yes. Yeah, I, can, I think we'll, hopefully we'll see some more of those comparisons, maybe the, a leg comparison then between 15 to 16, just as we get more of those runners through, just to, you know, Joey was asking which which way was the, the best, and he obviously he'd only just uh, uh, finished his course, and uh, we were like, we don't really know yet what the best, what the quickest one of those was. Here's Thomas Crifter on his way to control number 25. I mean, you can look on the ground how much it's tracked up and they, you could get a sense that it was, was going to do that um, on this type of terrain. And you have that advantage with running towards the latter parts of this race. Mm, and Clifton was about one minute and 10 behind at the first TV control. Now towards the second TV control, feeling is that he lost a few seconds here. He's gone a lot longer way to the right, I think, compared to some of the others. Needs to just watch out. 
But it's only a short control here, well bounded by lots of other features as well. Here he is. Oh. Ha ha ha, we've spotted him, but has he spotted the control? Yeah, I think so. Or he's close at least. Yeah, there we go. So into fifth position then at control number 25. So Max Petterbamer will be the next one we see at this control number 25. And you can see he is quicker than our current leader at the finish, Simone Mark, but not by an awful lot, to be honest. And he was quicker at the first TV control as well. There he was, he's still in the lead at the first TV control. 11 seconds ahead of Isaac von Krusenstern. See if it's still 11 seconds or if it's more now. Well, it's definitely more. Let's see this. And Max Petterbamer takes the lead then. Sweden 1, 2, 3 here. 36 seconds ahead of von Krusenfuena. Okay, let's have a comparison. We're looking at Christoph Meyer here. Maybe, hmm, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see why he's been highlighted. Yeah, very he's interesting. He's not one of the later starters. Trying to find him here in the result lists. So this is a leg replay as if they'd started from control yeah. 15 together. Interesting to see. It's almost exactly the same route as Simon Imark. Maybe a bit faster pace there by Christoph Meyer. Mm. Then staying a, a bit higher up. Ah, going up oh. there to this other track, up to the other bounds area. Kind of like what we saw from a lot of the women, I think. Uh, Take going very close to that. Then I guess that area. he is heading up here towards this other path. Then taking the climb there. Ah, oh, this seems rough. <sighs> Look at this, it looks very, very steep where he is at the moment. Not oh. really sure why we I wish I could see the end to, to see how who, who yeah, can and why we got to follow Christoph Meyer. I think it may be a comparison with someone. Can see His race was very, very different, I think. How the weather conditions yeah. just shifted. This is Simon Imark when he started quite a while ago. And yeah. when he finished, the sun was out. <laughs> but such a good race here. And uh, I think that's a French TV interviewing him. It is him. indeed. Uh, no, that's a replay, not a leg replay now. Here we get Eskil Schinneberg. In the comparison, he punched there in 17th position, 2.23 behind at control 15. So 2.23 behind uh, E-Mark. Quite the same route as von Krusenkoena. And we have that seen the body to 17th control yet, so maybe we'll see him very soon there. Here he is. There he is. That's why they played it faster mm -hmm. in the end, <laughs> in order to not miss him towards the control. No, and the descent is... So I was about to say almost tougher than the climb. It's almost tougher than the mm -hmm. climb. My feeling is that he lost more time now it was 2.23 at the control before. He has not punched the control, the pre-warning. One before. I think it's about a minute from here to the next control. Mm -hmm. And maybe, yeah, again, es uh, Eskoshin about 31st on the middle distance. He has had much better forest results than this, so maybe someone who can learn a lot uh, and take a lot away from how to improve from these races. 
heading into the winter with a list of things to work on. I think a lot of the athletes will have, have that feed it feeling after these races. Here he is, though. Here's a Norwegian. So 11th place, equal 11th place there with Francis Leclerc Capburn. Two minutes, 45 seconds. Slower at this, the 17th control. We are waiting then for some of the last few runners to get to our first TV point. So we've got Tim Robertson, Emil Svensk, Gustav Bergman, Martin Regborn, Kasper Fosser still to make their way to that point. There's a, quite a lot of running before they get to uh, control 16-17. And one man who's done the 14.4K, 635 metres of climb, I repeat, 635 metres of climb, is Martin Hubman. Had quite a good finish. He was about 4.53 behind at the second TV control, but then compared to Max Peter Beimer, so he could keep the speed more or less. Yeah, it will be seventh place for him as he gets cheered into the finish. So we'll go just slower than Fabian Abersold, just faster than Soldini. So five minutes and eight seconds slower than Simon Imark. Not giving too much away there. <laughs> Let's go back to yeah. this long route choice then. Now we got the Emil Svensk here in the comparison. When he punched the control. Let's look for him here. You can tell he's kind of going up and down quite a lot. Oh yeah, he punched in third position, 44 seconds behind Imark. And uh, 12 seconds ahead of Beymer. Okay, let's see what it is by the time he gets the control. It's got a drop down here. Uh, this, of course, is where Von Krusen kind of slightly kind of too high. has to double back to get to that control. Let's see if we can spot him. Ah, but there he we go. Lost, he lost a bit of time compared to Beymer, I guess, because mm -hmm. he seemed to be behind Von Krusen Kvarna. It's so, about a minute to go from here. I think about 45 seconds, mm -hmm. hopefully, this leg. <laughs> Trying to keep the balance in the slope. It's a complete all-body all workout. <laughs> and the comparison to the others from Cruz and Fernandez is still in the lead of those three Swedes. Emil Svensk then climbing here. You can see he's preparing the next few controls, just refolding the map and into third place then. 21 seconds off the pace. Two seconds ahead of Daniel Hoopman. And here, well, there are not many runners to follow in this picture here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're back with Swiss runner Fl Florian Hovalt. Mm -hmm. Still fighting for this top 10 position towards control 3. Yep, and that's the 30th control, so into 11th spot. Just kind of dropping a few seconds here and there for me, Florian Hovald. OK, 
can see the way he's trying to just catch short glimpses of the map whilst still trying to stay on his feet, dropping down the slope. Choosing the opportune moments to get as much information as he possibly can from the map. So look, Captain, I think it will be the next to Interesting see. Interesting route there to Control 22. Not at all the same as everyone else took. Look, Kappen seems to be kind of on the up at the moment. 22nd place in the middle distance. And notably, I think maybe his best run of the week will, be, will have been his relay run, first leg. Oh, but this is quite a good race so far by Loic Kappen. was the 24th control. Mm, there's quite a bit to go to the next control. Maybe into a top 10 position. We'll be fighting against Martin Hoopman at this TV control here. Caught Elias Kuka by the three minutes. Maybe that's it's definitely a finish kit ahead. There's not been too much, I mean, at least in the production that we've seen here, not been too much kind of bunching of, of runners. They have a three minute starting interval here for the last, I think, 30 runners. It was two minutes for those starting earlier, where I probably would have had more people catching up. And then, of course, we have them in the world ranking order as well. So we, well, if you trust the numbers, then we should get a better, slightly better runner with every starting time. So usually they don't group together too much. But yeah, I, I, I mean, it's a good thing with three minutes. Makes the competition day very long, but it's a good thing for the for the competition, I guess. Okay, so Daniel Hoodman is actually looking pretty good here. He mm, was, I think, indeed. behind some of some of those runners we see uh, at the first TV split, but now he's ahead. He was 12 seconds behind Isaac von Krusenkwen at the first TV split. Now he's ahead mm. about yeah, about 25 seconds, maybe. Okay, what can Daniel Hoodman do after his bronze medal yesterday? But the interesting will be to compare him to Max Peter Bamer. We didn't have him in this GPS replay, and I think it's going to be quite tight between the two of them. Quite sure he will beat von Cruz and Quen at that point. So he will not be quicker than Bema, but it's only going to be a couple of seconds off for mm. Daniel Hoodman. Six seconds. It was very interesting to follow him. It's it's not at all that stop and go orienteering he's doing. He's very running very smoothly through the terrain, having a lot of map contact. But and he's maybe, also very strong in keeping direction. That's kind of his thing to do. And in this flat part there between control 22 and 25 of course when you have the direction as your base and then read the features to it you can be you can orient here quite quickly this and that's the, the yeah the situation that works very well to him as we see Gustav Bowman do the climb and let's see what has happened here this is the uh, 16th control we get mm -hmm. the time check of the next one and look goodness me he's already two and a half minutes slower yeah, he was already two minutes and 20 seconds slower at the control before so some mistakes maybe in those downhill controls. You, we were talking a lot about how the downhill controls are, are so tricky. And uh, I mean, of course, then he was behind, two minutes and 20 behind uh, E-Mark. Uh, so he has lost much more time now compared to Max Peter Beimer. But this is a tough race. And if you have a bit of problems with your back from the beginning, well, those slopes won't make it better. Mm, no, they really won't. You can see that. Yeah, just the running up that slope is really, really challenging. I would have loved to have seen that maybe the first part of his race where they've got those lots of controls, lots of quite short controls, I think. 
A good lot of people would have made mistakes around there, absolutely. Seems this to be one a of Svensk. the Svensk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's, it's Victor Svensk because we have seen Emil quite recent, recently. Yeah, this looks like into the third uh, TV control. See, looking in all the directions. Yeah, look, they can see this is Victor Svensk. Let's have a look at the GPS tracking. Close to see my new mark here. Mm -hmm. And we kind of lost his GPS there. So Victor Svens got the second TV control. He was 146 behind Max Peter Beimer and a 110 behind Isaac von Krusenstjerna. Yeah, lost, lost a bit some more time, time here. Yeah. We're at the control. Here's. Is it Gauter? Yeah, I think it is Gauter. Gauter Hellenstever. So. Still one 11. more control to go until the time will stop for him. No. No, that's. No, no, that was the control. Into fourth position, 2.11. Okay, so here's Mika Kirmler. The next we'll see at control 25. Mm, and he is actually quite close to the current leader, but this was a strange route there. That was a strange there. route. <laughs> yeah. yeah he, he must be quite tired <laughs> in order to do that. Uh, oh, you can see and here. now, yeah. Maybe losing a bit of control here. Just didn't see the control there. Ah, there we go. It was very, very close to it. <laughs> I think it just, just the, the vegetation slightly deeper. Oh, he's annoyed. Kirmula was 134 behind at the first TV control. So it's definitely more now. It's around two minutes. Sparing quite a lot here on this <laughs> short section. Yep, so you're right, it's just going to be about the two minute gap. But he was a lot closer, and then that strange route into 22 has yeah, pushed him back a little bit. Quite a has have, have lost uh, focus for just a short while and then missed this junction there, followed the wrong route. But this is interesting here. Kasper Fosser. Yeah, today's favourite. And together, together with, with Martin, Martin Regborn. So he's caught up Martin Regborn, but the two of them are still slow because that isn't even the control we're getting the time from. I think no, it's going to another 45 seconds. And look how muddy and tracked up that is for the, these later starters. The two of them, they've been together already at the control before. Both uh, Foster there was 2 minutes and 15 behind compared to E. Mark and 1.19 compared to Beimer. And Rekman was more than five and a half minutes behind. So you can see he was already behind by control 15. Oh, and it kind of does that Joey Haddon route of... Changing yeah. tactics there. Often it's that, that's not a very good thing to do very often, but uh, quite a disadvantage already early in the race or like halfway through. Mm, so outside of the top 10 for Casper Fosser and ah, three minutes slower for uh, Martin Regborn. So but it's still within two minutes, but he loses time around. 120 compared to Hoopman and yeah, almost two minutes compared to Max Peter Beimer. So what are we just over halfway through the course mm -hmm. if we're expected a winning time of 90 minutes? Can he make up two minutes in the in the last half of the course? It will be very tough, I guess. It doesn't seem as he has this 
like this special kind of gear that he had at the World Championships. It seemed that he is, has, is running at the same speed as the others, more or less, but having a small struggles. And we haven't seen big mistakes, for example, by Max Bitterbeimer so far. He's having a great race. This can be a really, really good result in the end for Max Bitterbeimer. Yeah, I, I've got to agree with you there. I think. It's going quite He's high. one really challenging. Climbing here. quite high here in order to get a bit above the control to this yellow lane. Maybe it's a bit Ooh, too high up. A bit too high. Some hesitation ah, maybe into the control. Oh, he no, lost about bad. 20 seconds on this one, but no big mistake. Okay, so ah, punch that control. I mean, it's, it's tight between them, so every second counts. This is Max Peter Bamer to so the yep, control. A lead new leader. by just 16 seconds. But of course, we've got to remember Imark is the leader at the finish because we know Von Krisenplan had made a mistake at the end. Yeah, but he lost uh, about 20 seconds compared to Von Krisenplan. But he was much faster compared to Simon Imark. That was Between an incredible of dive roll of a, <laughs> of a save on that uh, fall. Uh, many, many orienteers will be tripping throughout the forest, I think. You've got to stay upright, read the map, go in the right direction, be fast. Oh. Well saved. And see you Mark. His day is looking better and better, to be honest. Yeah, but Max Bitterbame was more than a minute, almost a minute faster on this section between the second TV control and the third one. And uh, yeah, we know that we have to compare Max Bitterbame to Simon Mark and not to Isaac van Cruz and Kwerner. So yes, almost two minutes to go in order to take the lead in the finish. But you look at some of the later runners like Ole Janeho, maybe people we thought would be in contention. We know that uh, Gustav Bowman is already late. We know Martin Regborn yeah, yeah, has of course. Are already late. I mean, Emil Svensk is a bit closer up. But it's a great race for Imark. I mean, we have not even seen his start in the broadcast. So he started very early and uh, had a good race throughout the course. I mean, we have talked about Van Krusen kind of was leading at almost every uh, split time here. But Imark was always only like 20 seconds behind, and then in the end it changed. So he had a good race for sure as well. Yeah, he really, really did. And this is 25th control, waiting, I think, for Oli Ranho next towards that spot. But as uh, some of those higher ranked runners are kind of falling by the wayside, we're looking for those who are going to be able to match that time of Simon Imark. Max Petterbeimer for sure one of those. Daniel Hubman too. Emil Svensk as well. There's Oli Oyanho and he is 2.33, so just in the top 10. Okay, let's have a leg replay here. And we've got Jonas Saldini, yeah. who's the only one to go down to this track. Let's have a little look <laughs> and see. I think if Matthias Kibberts had been running this, he would have gone down to the track and we'd have had a good good old comparison there. But the you thing can is, even see so many micro route choices. But I think that. that Max Peter Bamer executed this leg very, very good. So uh, I think that's for sure a good option. But let's see, Kirmala had a good start there on this leg as well. Yeah, he goes up to the track a little bit But at sooner. least if you compare Soldini to Imark, I mean, he, he gets the street all the way. And even if it's not much faster compared to um, Imark, then it's at least you can save some energy. It's quite an easy way. It's, you get kind of three meters there where you don't have to push too hard. And, uh, yeah, going up the hill, he's in the lead, is you know, Saldini. Yeah, but I think that Kirmula might be a bit faster on it. Would have been really good to get to see it all the way. Hope we will get back to this. This is Shinnebari. To the way to the second TV control. We have had him at the first TV control in position 13. Two minutes and 45 seconds behind. Yeah, I think he's had a really good middle section then. He's not lost much of But he's still time. about he's, a minute to yeah, go from here. he's still got the next control to go. Again, you can see that strapping up on his neck, I think. Maybe carrying an injury. 
Well, almost definitely carrying an injury if he's got something, he's got the tape on his neck. And on his shoulders as well. Here's that route to recap of the route from Esco Shinaberry. And you can see the gap back to the others, the leaders. Very direct though, pretty much. Sticking close to the line, having good direction. Let's catch him now as this is the 25th control. Okay, so Esco Shinaberry into 10th spot. Currently 3.18. So most of his time losses, I think, coming in the first kind of third of the course. So I did some calculations here on the Soldini and on the Kirmula's route choice on the long leg. And uh, Kirmula was almost a minute faster compared to Jonas Soldini, so it's, it was definitely better to go straight. Yeah, to take that climb at the start of the leg. Okay, looking for Victor Svensk then. Will he be able to match the time of Joey Haddon? The youngster here. And this is a, quite a good run again by Viktor Svensk. It's definitely going to be one we're going to watch out for in future years. Here's his first year as a senior athlete. And hasn't he shown some fantastic potential? I mean, we know already from watching the big major club relays that the Svensk clan, the family are really good. And this is another fantastic performance. Is he going to sneak in ahead of Joey Haddon here? And I mean, he is already a European champion, so it's, it's able to win the relay there with the Swedish team. One second behind Joey Haddon, though, into fourth place. And again, to be a junior stepping up, the, one of the biggest challenges we often hear from, from juniors making their way into the senior level is the step up in the long distance specifically to suddenly go up to a, a 90 minute winning time. And if you're not winning, you're going to be well over the 90 minutes. Uh, it's incredibly grueling and physically challenging, mentally challenging too, to be able to make that. And Comparison then of Joey Haddon and Emil Svensk. Emil Svensk will see next into Control 25 then. And this maybe is going to be a fight again between Emil Svensk and Viktor Svensk in the finish. Ah, maybe oh. not. That's an unnecessary mistake getting to the railway there. So a few I think mistakes he, from Emil 13, Control 13 and Control 23 have written a couple of those down. He must have found an animal track there between and followed this one instead of the track we see on the map. Otherwise it's hard to understand why he would go into this direction. Yeah, so another battle of the Svensk brothers. Emil won yesterday. Will it be one all? I mean, we, I mean, we see that there was a tight fight between Hadon and Emil Svensk, but Hadon did some mistakes in the beginning as well, so it might be, yeah, we might see a special fight there again. Yeah, really, really might be. That's <laughs> <laughs> not the tough, not the worst I've, injury I've we've seen. I've seen worst yeah. injuries here at um, this world, uh, this World Cup final. Okay. So we've just seen Victor Svensk in. We might see Max Petter Bema then really soon, I think. See if he can take a new leading time. I think we see him here, right? Mm -hmm. At Emil Svensk. Yeah, this is uh, round controls 24 25. I think this is 24 that he'll punch just up here. So then we can get the first comparison between him and Viktor Svensk. It's the next control, that's the 
Split time, but here's Max Peter Bremer on the way to the finish. And I think we're going to have a new best time, right? Let's have a look. Let's get the time up here. See what we can see with Max Peter Bremer. Simone Mark has been sitting on that leader's chair for a actually. long old time. It could be very tight with him and uh, Simone Mark. And he's just, you can see that there is so much fatigue in the body there, but he is working hard on these last few meters. There he is. Let's have a look and see what we can So the lead was time. 146 at the second TV, or the third TV control. Fortunately, we don't get the time in here. But let's see it come up on our screens ahead. Oh yeah, he's a new leader. A new leader then, how many seconds? By one minute and 24 seconds. One minute 24. It's very, a very satisfying. Max Bemis, he is so happy with that. He really should be I because... Could also not only hear him, but also the coach on the Leo back there. Very, very happy and yeah, you hear it. He, he hasn't done any big mistakes on the course here. Oh, this is gonna be hard to beat, I can tell you. Oh, look at that, the congratulations from the coach. Oh, that was very, very good. That was very good. And that performance could really stack up when we look back. I mean, to we the, have no the, one the else out there no. faster so far, and we haven't seen any mistakes. He's six seconds ahead at the second TV control compared to Daniel Hoopman. So I think this is going to be... I mean, there's a chance that Daniel Hoopman will, will take it, but it will be hard because... Well, we haven't seen any mistakes. Very no, much we Not haven't seen any mistakes at all. And of, the, no! of the GPS we have seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that says it all. I don't think yeah. he has missed a lot. No, I don't think he's missed much at all. When you, when you get that response to someone crossing a line, you don't even need to ask them if their run was good. You already know that their run was good. And here we have uh, Emil Svensk. That one can give you the time. It's he's punching there into ninth position, uh, and he's actually a minute, no, 30 seconds behind his brother. So let's build that <laughs> fight <laughs> up there between the two brothers. Yeah, yes. we see Daniel Hoopman here. Another fight we can build Whoa. up is between Daniel Hoopman and Max Peter Beimer, and you see that's not many seconds there. No, not Yet many at all. Beimer a bit high up the hill there. And this is where Daniel Hoopman was really good yesterday, yeah. was and in you can controls see like this. He's really good today oh. as well, now he's in front. Oh, you can see just in the last 100 meters, he made a difference of about 15 or 20 seconds there. Mm. So very soon into the picture, here he is. Oh, that looks good. He's running together with Elias Kuka there. 23 seconds, though, ahead of Max Petterbeimer, who has just come in to take the new leading time. Max Petterbeimer takes his position on the leader's chair. And the man who's just vacated his position on the leader's chair, Simon Imark, has just joined me in the commentary position. You've had a long old sit down in the, co in the leader's chair. You must be really happy with that. Yeah, but it was nice weather, so it was no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your race and what you think went really well for you. Well, uh, it was a really good technical performance by me, so I'm uh, really satisfied with that. Uh, maybe I felt sometimes that I could have pushed more. Uh, so I guess I lost some time on the just running legs, uh, but uh, anyways, I'm really satisfied with doing a good technical performance. Yeah, we had lots of different sections. We had the slope, you had mm. some of the sections with more uh, undergrowth, more intricate contours. Was there a bit you think you did best of all of them? Uh, well, in the beginning, I was. Uh, I like this downhill uh, technical part, uh, and I guess when it's uh, technical, that suits me really well. Uh, then when I've been sitting here for some hours, then I've been analyzing the legs. So I saw that I lost some time between the 22nd and the 23rd because I was running there and there was some path that wasn't on the map where I could see. So I was a bit lost there. So I saw that uh, they cost, mm, caught time on me. But uh, yeah, in all, a really good race. Mm. Uh, you had good performances in Switzerland at the World University Champs as well, I think. So what about racing here works well for you? Yeah, well, now there was quite a different terrain uh, from the long, at least, at the Student World Championship. But 
Uh, I don't know, usually it suits me when it's really technical, but now for these races in Switzerland it's a bit been more technical. So, uh, And I also felt quite strong in the hills, so uh, that, uh, that's nice for next year, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it must give you a lot of confidence. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, congratulations. I think that time's going to stack up really well when we have a lot of the later runners in as well. So congratulations to you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great running then from Simon Imark. And uh, yeah, he's had lots of time on the leader's chair to evaluate his run and see where he did well. And I think interesting to hear he felt he did well on those downhill controls. And I think that's really, uh, I want to see more of what, they, uh, what are the best, uh, the highest ranked runners have done there because I think that's where they've lost a lot of time. And I mean, it's a good thing if you can say that you've done well in the downhill controls today because there are quite a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are loads of them. Okay, so we can see, we've just seen a little picture of Gustav Bergman. Yeah. We've also got Kasper Fosser here on the picture and he is slower than both yeah, Imark and Bema. We had him almost two minutes behind. Now it's around one minute. So a bit closer again. Well, we'll see what Gustav Bergman can do first. Uh, but look, he's been dropping even more time here in this course. It's not going to be by any stretch of the imagination Gustav Bergman's best run today. And this is the control there. He does kind of, doesn't look like he's flowing super kind of well through the terrain. Just checking the small glimpses of the map. We'll catch him at this control next. Mm, this is the control where we get the split time. Here he is, I guess. Ah, it's no, Tim that's Robertson. Tim Robertson first. Punching to 50 second position, 11 minutes behind. Looking out for Gustav Bergman. I can oh, hear I him, hear him yeah. first. <laughs> oh, I can't. I, can't, I wish they need to surround. Uh, there, there we go. Is. There he is. Just can catch that and can get lock eyes on the Kiwi, on Tim Robertson. I think we 18th should. 18th place, though. We should get Casper Foster into the picture very soon as well. Yes, we should indeed, because Casper Foster started six minutes after Gustav Bergman. And he was 147 behind at the first TV control. I think here we have him. Yeah, yes, still indeed. running with Martin Regborn. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's quite a bit to go. What did you say about a minute? Yeah, I think so. So he's still he's still yet yes. to punch the 24th control. Mm -hmm. It's just in this dip here, I think. There we go. Still running with Regborn. Yeah, about a minute oh. from here to go. So he was about two minutes behind. 147 he was 147 behind. 147 behind. We'll check here. Ah, he, he is closer for he sure. Is closer. But is it is close, it close enough? enough? That's the question. Because from here... It's, it's not much further to go and, and, and it's not too As we tricky. said before, they're not, we, ha we haven't seen many mistakes of the leaders here, Max Peter Beimer and not Daniel Hoopman either. So Kasper Fosser, it just looks like he's gliding through this terrain and odd intervals to check the map. Here he is, looks around. They just doesn't that even look good. at the control to I mean, punch he's it. He's not so far behind, he's <laughs> 40 seconds faster okay. between the first and the second TV control. Soon, I, I think we will see Daniel Hoopman yeah. towards the finish. So there's only six more controls to go. Can oh, he catch up all that time? It's going to be so gonna, tough. It's going to be so exciting between Hoopman and uh, Max Peter Beimer, maybe also uh, Kasper Fosser. You could just see how much map contact he had, how, yeah, how much time he invested in reading the map there, because it's a very flat part. You have to get the features right. So those are the standings at Control 25 then. We've just seen Casper Fosser through there. He was the last starter, so we've now had everybody through at that point. 
And uh, Max Petterbamer, the current leader, is in the lead at that point as well. But we know Daniel Hibben had a really good section down to, down to control 29. He was fantastic. Uh, and to 30 as well. So we will wait to see him very soon. Mika Kimmela will be the next one we see, I think, at control number 30. It's very impressive to see that he had the exactly same players as yesterday. He could make such a difference, Daniel Hoopman, on just a few meters. It's all those technical parts. He, you know, maybe doesn't have the speed of some of the others or the, the strength on the climbs quite as much as he used I mean, to, but the, when it gets technical, there's, for there's sure he has the speed very as few well. people better. Oh, I mean, <laughs> yes, he definitely does. And he has the speed on this long distance and for 90 minutes. It's incredible. Max Petterbamer, though, on the little deck chair to enjoy sitting in the leader's chair. He looks a bit oh, nervous, a bit though. Yet. He really does look a bit nervous. But oh, maybe because, here. yeah, here we There's go. There's a Here's gap, Daniel definitely. Hoopman. It was 23 seconds at the TV control. And let's see what happens here. <laughs> Punching 33 without problem. Getting towards 34 as well. Under oh, the bridge to nice. 35, different options there. Maybe a bit faster for Max Peter Beimer. But I mean, that should be good enough for Hoopman. It should be good enough. Oh, I think it should be good enough for Daniel Hoopman. Like, we can hear the, the cowbells of Switzerland comes. ringing, and here he comes. He's going to get an almighty load of support uh, from this crowd, and you can see the time ticks down. He's got just about a minute to go to see if he can take a new leading time here. Yeah, that's going to be good enough. And this may well be good enough for the win here for Daniel Hubman. At age 39, he is once again going to be at the top of the standings here. His technical skills, his speed, his endurance, his ability to work through all the different parts of this terrain are going to lead Daniel Hoopman to be the new leader and very, very possibly the winner of this and final race at the World Cup. Fantastic run there from Daniel Hoopman. And very impressive. You could kind of feeling throughout the whole season. Already in Estonia, many of the coaches said that Hoopman was in great shape just before he got uh, ill there. And then now this weekend, you could just see at the relay already great performance. Performance. And yesterday, a super good race, uh, especially that part there in the slope, the, exactly the same part as we had him today, making the difference. And then today, just a very good race. Maybe not the best start into the race. He was a bit behind uh, at the first, just before the long leg. But then he had a good route on this long leg and could make the difference in this middle section here. Oh, wow, fantastic result from Daniel Hoopman again. <laughs> Tr trying to catch a glimpse of what he said. Not sure we got anything from there, but let's have a look then. Confirmation of those current standings. Daniel Hoopman taking a new leading time. Quite possibly the win here with those behind uh, making mistakes in the terrain, losing time, particularly, I think, in the first part of the course, the likes of Kasper Fosser and uh, of Gustav Bowman as well. Uh, but the man who's just been pushed off the leader's chair is Max Petterbaumer. I mean, your reaction when you crossed the line was fantastic. You must be feeling amazing right now. Uh, yes, for sure. Uh... Uh, I mean, uh, Dan now Dan Daniel takes over the lead, but uh, I can only feel the happiness and joy uh, uh, of this race and uh, super happy and uh, yeah, super content. Yeah, we, we didn't need to know whether your race had gone, gone, we didn't need to ask you whether your race had gone well. We could see it in your face <laughs> and in your reaction, but uh, even when you were running out there in the course, did it feel really good? Yes, uh, I mean, complete different feeling from yesterday where I uh, I felt that I had all, uh, all, the, um, all the energy, and uh, but I just uh, forgot to read the map and uh, pushed, uh, ran like away from my own orienteering. And today, completely different. I, 
I disconnected my uh, my like powers all over the course and yeah, super happy. There was lots of different parts of the terrain today. Um, did you feel like you were able to adapt to all of the different parts, the slope, the downhill controls, some of the little more technical parts with intricate contours? Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I I felt that I had some problems in the beginning. I uh, had to take it really easy, but. I mean, uh, you, you gotta do what you gotta do to <laughs> make uh, like uh, to avoid the mistakes and uh, yeah. And uh, I felt that I uh, I could push uh, quite a lot in the uphill, so I just uh, hope that uh, it will be enough. And your long leg looked pretty good. How did you decide what to do for the long leg? Uh, we we had uh, put some of the some of some similar legs. Uh, uh, during the, uh, these uh, days before, and uh, I felt that uh, it, it it's not maybe like it's a good drew choice to go up to the trail, and I tried to uh, to just uh, stick a little bit, uh, not go up too much in the beginning, and then uh, yeah, on the track it was. It was, it was nice done. and fast. <laughs> well, congratulations. It looks like a really fantastic race for you. I'm sure it will give you lots of confidence going into the winter. And thank you so much for chatting to us. I think it will end up in a good position, I think, uh, once we see the other runners come through as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, you can't stop Max uh, Pedabema smiling at the moment, and I think neither can you stop Daniel Hoodman uh, smile either because his course was fantastic uh, here today. And we've got kind of, let's think about who else can, can come in and challenge. Emil Svensk, maybe Kasper Fosser, I think. Uh, the only ones who are going to be able to I challenge. I think it's only lead. Kasper Fosser only out Kasper there. Only Kasper Fosser. Just one minute and six seconds behind at the second TV control. So we have to wait for him at the third TV control. But Daniel Hubman looks like he executed the, the slightly longer leg, 28 to 29, so well. I think it's going to be really hard to, to, to match that technically. <laughs> So we've got to wait now 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes to see if we can see Casper Fossa here. A lot of people checking the split times, I think. A lot of people checking the GPS tracking to see what that's going to be. And do you think Daniel Hoodman will have a bit of a nervous wait now? Or do you think mm -hmm. he'll feel confident? I, I think it can be quite confident. I mean, I didn't have any mistakes here. It's one minute, of course. It's compared to Casper Foster, who might, if he finds another gear here in the last part, can be dangerous again. But... I mean, he has to get through first. He has to get this 29th and 30th control without any problems. And he has to be faster doing it than Hoopman. And this was exact, exactly the place where Hoopman could make the difference. So he wasn't slow at that point either. This is Emil Svens. Mm -hmm. Yep, on his way down the slope towards controls 29 and 30. And we can see if we can spot him coming down the hill here. And this is the fight 30. for the victory within the family. Mm -hmm. So at the last TV control, he was behind his younger brother, Viktor Svensk. Almost exactly half a minute. So we're just waiting for Emil Svensk here in the forest. Might oh, have overtaken oh. his brother. Hurt his Aye. leg there. <laughs> you can really <laughs> you can feel the pain. the pain by just mm -hmm. hearing this. Oh, 
<laughs> cursing there. Same time as Simon Mark. And now he's in ah. front of his brother. He is indeed. Back to the finish. Oli Oyano here. Ah, this he's is going good to be in his third place. Well. This is a good run. I think, again, he's suffered a lot of time losses towards the beginning, but caught up here, I think. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. Oyano was more than two minutes behind. Ah. Oh, so oh, the this. potential for people to catch up, maybe, including Casper Fosser. At the third TV control, Oyano was two minutes and 14 behind. In the finish, it's only 1.39. So if we take that and... Look at Kasper Foster. There's definitely there's a still a race on here. Definitely. definitely, it is by no means over. A very good finish here for mm. Oli, Oli Oyano. Yeah, you can see that unlike others, you know, you keep that speed up, you keep the strength up all the way through to the finish. And, and if you look at the split time, see was already at the first TV split. He was 1.38 behind in the finish. It's 1.40, so he didn't lose time, time from this first TV Bayer. control to the finish. OK, let's highlight control number 28. Mm -hmm. Interesting. We see that Beimer and Hoopman, they went around on the path. Elias Kuka decided to go straight. I mean, in a long distance, it's always towards the end. It's always convenient to take the path, especially in the climbings. Um, just gives you an opportunity to plan the next controls. It gives you an op opportunity to maybe relax, uh, not only physically, but also mentally a little bit because... So, a recap then of the current standings. Daniel Hubman still with that lead. And the race is by no means but over. The interesting thing here is that Oyana was mm. able to almost catch half a minute on this last section compared to Daniel Hubman. So, this definitely opens up for Foster again. But the thing is that Foster hasn't been at the third TV control, and that's just before the third TV control. It was maybe the best part of Daniel Hoopman. So it's kind mm -hmm. of, yeah, of course, he has a chance to win back time in the end, but he also has to get through towards control 29 and 31st. And it will be a nervous wait for Hoopman. <laughs> it definitely will. I think it's nervous because he hasn't sat down yet. <laughs> He, he can sit on this leader's chair, but he just hasn't sat down. This looks like Emil Svensk. And I think we're on the last few controls. We can follow him uh, there. It's a little fence area. And if he's going up, I think it's maybe going into control 35. Uh, it's hard for us to tell. Mm, and Emil Svensk was in a shared fourth position together with Simon Niemark at the, at the third TV control. A bit more than two minutes behind Hoopman. Ah, uh, yeah, so he's going towards control number 33. Do you think he lost the time, Hoopman, there just towards control 35? Where we can see that he shows a bit differently compared to Max Peter Beimer. He went down the stream That's earlier. That's a good question, but I don't think so. I and think he 
we can see, I mean, here the difference between him and Svensk is almost exactly two minutes. So if, if Svensk is closer in the finish, it's quite, it's quite plausible that it is this control there. Oh, yeah, it's that one. But now he actually does take a seat, uh, does have that chat with Max Petterbema. Okay, this oh, is Casper Fossa. Now, this is the man we need to look out for. It's the green close here. here. It's definitely close here. It's not one minute anymore. No. Ooh. Let's say it's around 30. 35 seconds, maybe. Oh, but they slow so much on the climb, it's... Mm. But you were right in saying that Daniel Hoodman has such a good route into 29. Yeah, look at this now. He took this small track there, then just getting it. But look at Foster, he's exactly at the same place mm -hmm. now. Maybe a bit better here, even. But it's this part here where Hoodman was really fast. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but it's close, it's close. Here we have him, Kasper Foster in the picture, still together with Martin de Riekborn. Yeah, absolutely. We can see him on the way to the next few controls. Time is taking. There are many runners here. One of them is the cameraman. Yeah, so that was the 24th Tim Robertson control. As well. Time is taking now. I think there's about yeah, 45 but seconds from that control. through this. He's racing this. So much, and now there are six pairs of eyes here as well. I mean, yeah, we know that there is the possibility to gain back half a minute in the end. <laughs> it's almost advantage Foster now. It is almost advantage Foster here, but but look, look, he's still, he's not still yet. behind Daniel not Goodman. Yet. Not yet. Anything can happen in this last part of the race. We can watch him. Here he is chopping down towards the control, which is just kind of to the left of our shot here. Let's have a look at the time. So he was just over a minute slower, and now it's only... It's only a few seconds, it's really. Well, it's almost exactly half a minute. Mm -hmm. It's 29 seconds at control number 30. So some, uh, maybe some I mean, nervous faces. Compared to Baymer, uh, Hoopman was able to run eight seconds faster. But compared to Oyenau, he was 24 seconds slower. No, 34 seconds. <laughs> Oh, well, the race is on here, and I think we're going to follow Casper Foster around a lot of this as well. As Martin Regborn, they've been together. We saw them together at the first TV split, control 16, 17 as well. So you can see how they cross these sections of open, semi open as well, towards this control 31. I've seen people mistakes, make mistakes on this control 31, but you can see the, the forest just gets that little bit clearer as well. This looks like Eskil Shinneberry here into the finish. It is indeed. Can he improve on kind of a disappointing, I think, performance yesterday? Tenth place here, so it's quite yes, okay. already Top better performance so far. than yesterday. Max Petterbema does not want to get out of this, uh, no, of course this not. position here. He is enjoying this. Okay, let's have a look again. Com compare this leg then, 28 to 29. It's a leg replay as mm, if they'd all punched 28 together. That's the one we think that Hoopman was really, really good executing, especially this very last part of the route just before Control 29. Uh, from here, I even think that maybe just in this part, Fosse was almost a bit faster, but in the very end, just towards the Control, Hoopman was very good. And also down to Control 30. Here we have Emil Svensk on yep. the way to the finish. And Emil Svensk is going to be outside the top three here. And he is going to beat his brother again. By more than a minute. 
Yeah, the family competition. It will be outside the top five, but a top six position at the moment. We will have Casper Foster probably push him out of that, that top six spot. But at, at the moment, he goes into sixth position. Two minutes and 16 seconds. Mistakes for Emil Svensk on the course today. Controls 13, controls 23 for sure. Maybe a few more as well. So, oh, a close run thing for Emil Svensk. Okay. Well, that's those are the standings at the finish, and we are waiting for one more runner, and it's him. Yeah, this is Casper Fossa on the uh, uh, kind of arena control. This is control number 32, I think. I see that Gustav Berman is now in the group as well there. Yeah, so he's just been past that control number 32 compared to Daniel Hubman. That's what we're looking at. I think it's control 35 where Hubman has a bit of a time loss. Um, at least compared to Oyenau, not compared to Beimer. So you have to be really good. You have to get it really good there in the end in order to be faster than Hoopman. But there's definitely the possibility to be half a minute faster. So watch uh, the tracking. We will. We, we've got. I think all our running camera ops have been directed <laughs> to these last few controls, so we can try and spot him. And this. Oh, Daniel Hibbins looking. He's nodding. He's looking happy now. I think. Uh, I think he's quite happy with this. I'm. Don't want to call it too soon. Here's this open area just uh, before control you see number the thirty-three. Big group he has behind him, and they see also a train. For the track as well, that the, this area is tracked up quite a lot. So it's Robertson and it's Rick Bon, I guess. No, it's uh, Berman. Ah, Berman, yeah. Two Swedish runners. Yeah. They lost oh. Robertson. So they climb up onto the spur and towards control number 33 as well, and we can spot them all <laughs> round together. So. Casper Fosser has caught up Martin Rayborn by three minutes, caught up Gustav Bergman by six minutes. But and I'm sure he'll have now. had some feedback. If you're if you're talk, if you're a coach and you're talking to Casper Fosser, as he passes control 32, there's a coaching zone there. What do you say to him? Give it all, you're close. I mean it's you get closer and closer, you just keep on going and tell him how close he is. Uh, maybe even yeah, go with a white lie and uh, say it's a bit closer than it actually is. Yeah. Just to get him, I mean, yeah, push very hard. But you can see now that he's almost caught uh, Beimer. So if we remember the, the GPS tracking is often a little bit behind the picture. There's the control, I think. It looks as if uh, Berriman is struggling a bit to follow the others. Just shows you how high the speed is there. Ah, there was a control. The controls on the on the stream, not on the boulder. So, I mean, yeah, here it still looks. Beam. It looks still looks really good. I mean, if I just knew uh, and just had seen the GPS, I would think it's not possible. But we also have the time of Oya now, mm. and we know how much faster he was in this last section. So I wonder where it was. Somewhere it has to be. Mm. Uh, the feeling is that he didn't get much closer to Beimer at this part here, at least. No, the, the dots are going to come a lot closer together when they, uh, they're yeah, going of slower, the, of course. In the uphills. Just makes this terrain look so simple and so easy, and it's really anything but. That was the route across, I think, to control 31. These two men. I think, well, Max Petterbe, they're both guaranteed medals. But what will, the color, what will the color be? And Max Petterbe is, oh, is going to be close to silver or bronze, I think. And I think uh, Martin Dreykbaum 
Blackburn will be dreaming of Casper uh, Foster's back this night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just seen it uh, for about one and a half hour. And here you can see that Hoopman decided to go straight in. There would have been the possibility to go a bit more around, take the path there. Maybe get some meters uh, with very good runnability instead of having to go through the green. And this is out from control number 34. And look, the running cam is struggling to keep up with both of these runners as they now duck underneath this uh, railway track. And just two more controls to go. So this is where we can see Max Petter Bema going the different mm -hmm. way. But I know, I mean, we know that Bema wasn't faster from the TV control to the finish. Of course, we don't know if he was faster as faster as exactly this section here. And you see that Foster also goes straight in, so that should make an impact. Oh, so <laughs> the, 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 the time, the title has been yeah, given to Daniel Hibman, handshaking there. You can see that the time is now ticking down and we yeah, haven't yet got Casper Foster in the picture. Here he is. Is this a mistake? Oh, he won't beat it at least. Quite sure he can't make it to the finish within 35 seconds. And, uh, I wonder if... I don't think he will beat Bayman. Is oh, this is mistake? why Bema maybe makes this mistake because he goes. Ah, he loses take this a bit of time line. there. Yeah. Oh, he goes over the bridge. Ah. I mean, it's not. A, it will be, but I think he will be able to beat Foster as well. Ah, that won't be good enough to beat Hoopman. No. And I don't think it will be good enough to beat Bema. Two of them climbing together, he, and then the crowd are about to see Casper Fossa. So yeah, Daniel Hoodman has definitely won this last race of the World Cup. Yeah. And Fosse. it looks like it will be too late for second art as well, I think. Fossa would have needed an Oyonao finish here. It's not good enough to beat Hoopman and Bayman. No, Casper Fossa was a couple of minutes down at the first TV control. He has fought so hard to get back towards the leaders. It's not going to be first. It's not going to be a silver medal for Casper Fossa today. It will, though, be a bronze for the overall World Cup champion, Casper Fossa here. Too much left to do on these last few moments of the course. He's working hard, though, and Casper Fossa will be third at today's long distance on the final race of this World Cup season. But Daniel Hoodman is the champion here. He wins this long distance in Switzerland. And, yeah, and this impressive. will be a so very impressive. good feedback for him regarding the coming World Championships. And uh, I mean, Foster kind of, yeah, if you want to call it, lost the race in the beginning because he was 124 behind Hoopman at the first TV control. Uh, we could have the feeling that he gets closer in the towards the finish, but in the end he didn't really have the energy to just or the power to just get a pass uh, and pass uh, Daniel Hoopman. So it was a very good race by Foster. He really fighted his way back into this competition. And he, it's kind of the thing we talked about in the very, very beginning. This kind of terrain, especially the first part, maybe the the first half in the men's race, much more uh, advantage yeah. for the home nation. Second part, I guess, well, quite many nations can handle this kind of terrain, but when it's so steep, so steep slopes, you have to run parallel to them, you have to find the route choices, then it's much about experience. And then, of course, this makes the impact of the home advantage much bigger. Yeah. Daniel Hoodman was able to capitalize on that. He was able to get those, those downhill controls, the first kind of 15 controls, the first, even the first half of the race, I think, was he, where he was able to make uh, a really big impact uh, on that. And there was nothing Casper Fossa could do to try and catch up that part. And the, the technical orienteering from Daniel Hoodman was absolutely fantastic for him
He's seen a lot of Martin Rake Bontu there. <laughs> He's trying to find out who's beaten him. I might be talking about the, the overall World Cup. I didn't really listen to the beginning there. But those are the final results then. Confirmation. The top three within one minute. A long winning time here, estimated. One hour, 36 minutes and 24 seconds. Many of them, the, the early competitors being out a lot longer than that and a big mm. gap back to fourth. Uh, great fight here for the top three and also a very good performance by Oli Oya now. We didn't really Another have Another fourth place for him. Yeah, and we didn't really have him. On, on our list because he was one and a half minute behind at the first TV control then he was two and a half minutes behind at the second TV control and in the finish yeah it's only one and a half minutes so he was really really strong in this last section and a uh, great performance and we have other runners we haven't seen that often up uh, in the result list that high Simon E. Mark on fifth Isaac von Krusenkwen on sixth of course he has been up high in the result list in sprint before um, <laughs> Very good performances and a very interesting race uh, we have of, seen today. Yeah, awful lot of knackered orienteers out there, including Gustav Bowman. I think it was in the end a top 20 for him. And I think soon we're going to have a flower ceremony for those top three. Which is the old guy, he's okay. always the oldest. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's just Swedish say, saying that. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's the meaning in the end is like, uh, it's oldie but goldie or something like this. It's like, <laughs> he's the oldest one, but it's also the most, ex the oldest one knows best in the end. Yes, I know, uh, true. Yeah. Daniel Hoopman today, aged um, 39. I, I've said it before, I keep expecting him to retire and he keeps not retiring. I remember um, racing around the World Cup in the UK in 2005 and I had no idea who any of the elites were at that point. But he was one of those uh, racing there and just um, the longevity of his career is quite unbelievable. And the fact that he's able to take this again uh, Another another win on the World Cup circuit. But let's have the uh, top three then. Casper Foster doesn't know where to go when he's not won uh, <laughs> the, the relay, the, the relay, the competition. Oh, he's, yeah, look at his running kit. He's quite dirty, so he's been <laughs> fighting hard here. It really has. It has yeah, for all of them. That. He's been sliding down the slopes here. <laughs> but the third place goes to the overall World Cup winner. It is Casper Fossa. Even when he has a bit of a bad day, it's still pretty good, to be honest. Is it a bad day, really? I mean, he had some... We didn't see many struggles here. We didn't see, really, where he lost the time in the beginning, but he didn't lose a lot of time there, either. One of the, fa the uh, happiest men in the field today, and Max the, and, Bema. And the fastest moustache in orienteering. The fastest moustache in orienteering. It is Max Bema. His best result ever on a World Cup circuit, of course, taking the silver today. But, I mean, Daniel Hubman, when will this man stop being amazing? Because Daniel Hubman has had a fantastic race today. Yeah, fantastic. I hope he will. World Cup final. I mean, there's no reason to quit now. <laughs> no, <laughs> He's still the best. <laughs> He's still the best in Switzerland. He's still the best in the world here today. And all eyes in the Swiss team, definitely all eyes on all of the orienteering nations are going to go towards the World Cup, the World so Championships maybe, next year. Maybe we get the reason here, very lost time. Kasper Foster in the beginning looks quite okay here. In this first part, fastest one, a small mistake to control six, but still in the lead compared to the other ones. Then another mistake here at control eight, and that's the point where he lost. Uh, yeah, quite important seconds, maybe about one and a half minutes. And then another mistake at control 12, so really not the best start into this competition. At this point here, you can see it's more than one minute he is behind Bayman and Hoopman. Then the long control, the long route choice here. Not the best execution of this route, maybe going a bit low in the slope first and deciding to go up anyway. And at this point here he is about one and a half minutes, one yeah, 140 behind 
Beimer and Hoopman. Then we have them. Not all three of them going up there. Uh, Foster kind of on the Alexanderson route without getting stuck there. But I don't think that's good enough. Oh, I think he loses time there. Yeah, he, he has a really not the best first half of the race here. He could have won this race, definitely, if he had performed better in this first section. And then the second part, I think, was quite good by Fosse. But, I mean, the others had good second parts as well. Uh, no mistakes here. I mean, he was quite close here already. But it's hard to get in contact when no one does mistakes. And... Uh, this is the part I really like by Foster and Hoopman both executed that 29th control really good. Small, small mistake to 31 by Foster. Uh, and then this last part. Just maybe no, not really the energy to get past uh, Beimer either here on the very last part. Uh, get the feeling that he pushed really hard before already in order to catch and then just... Yeah, it wasn't just not good enough, but I mean, he ended up in a third position and uh, he won the overall World Cup anyway. He already decided that yesterday. I'm not sure whether we're going to hear from our uh, winner today, but um, thank you so much to everyone for watching these races in this World Cup final. It's been a dramatic series of races, a lot of fun to, to commentate on, and especially if you've been with us throughout the whole of the World Cup races this year. I hope you've enjoyed seeing the best orienteers in the world do what they do best, do some fantastic orienteering. And now up for a strong winter of training before being back for the World Cup next year. We will see you then. Yeah, hope to see you then.
congratulations to your overall win, Kasper Foster. How do you feel that now? Thank you. It feels, uh, I feel really great to uh, to uh, have the overall World Cup win again this year. It's especially since it's been quite uh, quite tough year for me with uh, always struggling with some injuries, and uh, I feel like uh, I really had to work hard for this one. So then it feels. Really amazing to have done it. Congratulations, Casper Foster. Thank you. The EGCA Orientation World Cup Final Prize give you so many long distance men. EGCA World World Cup Final Siegerehrung Long Distance Herren. The prizes are given by Leo Halda, President of the International Orienteering Federation. Die Preise werden überreicht durch IOF Präsident Leo Halda. The prizes are donated by our presenting partner EGK Gesundheitskasse. Die Preise wurden gestiftet von unserem presenting partner EGK Gesundheitskasse. In the sixth place, representing Sweden, Isak von Kruseherna. In the fifth place, also representing Sweden, Simon Imark. In fourth place, representing Finland, Olli Oyaraho.
Then to the podium, in third place, representing Norway, Kasper Fosser. In second place, representing Sweden, Max Peter Weimer. And on the top of the podium, the winner representing Switzerland, Daniel Huppa. Six best in the long distance World Cup event, the last of the year, with Daniel Hoffman on top of the podium as the winner. EGK Orienteering World Cup Finals, Prize Gaming Ceremony, Long Distance Women. EGK OL World Cup Final, Siegerehrung, Long Distance Damen. In sixth place, sorry, the prizes are given by Leo Halna, the president of the International Orienteering Federation. The prizes are given by IOF president Leo Halna. And uh, the prizes are donated by our presenting partner, EGK Gesundheitskasse. Die Preise wurden gestiftet von unserem Presenting Partner EGK Gesundheitskasse. Now, in sixth place, representing Switzerland, Sabine Hauswirt. Yeah. Now to the podium in third place, representing Switzerland, Elena Gauss. In the second place, representing Norway, Andrina Biermesen. And on the top of the podium, representing Switzerland, Madame Rutaren, Simona Eversol. Six best in a long distance competition for women here in Davos today.
Now also the results from the men's race are published. So 15 minutes from now for any complaints regarding the provisional results published from the men's race long distance here in the today. The prize giving so many will continue in a short while with the overall World Cup standings. Six best men and women and then the three best teams. Dear, dear athletes, spectators, team leaders, supporters, yeah, maybe it's too early to say goodbye, but I have to do this because of new prize giving will come soon. I can say that 2022 season was an extraordinary and historical season for IAF. Why? And we need to go back to the history. In 2015, in Scotland, we decided to split our world championships to forest and to sprint. And it took seven years, and now the competition program is fully implemented. We have annual world championships and European championships, sprint and forest in alternating years. We will see consequences of new competition program in coming years. And personally, I see that this drives more specialization in our sport and give chances for more nations for fight for medals. 2022 season was exceptional also because World Games in the US. We started our season very late, in end of May in Sweden, then followed by sprint orienteering World Championships in Denmark. Many of you spend a few weeks in the US. World Games is organized in every four years, and hope that you enjoyed the competitions in Birmingham, Alabama, in very hot and humid conditions. We returned to the forest in August with the European Championships in Estonia. This was a shock, maybe, for many of you. It was very difficult to adjust your speed to the relatively dense forest of Estonia. But now we are back in traditional orienteering country with IOF events, Switzerland. We always come to Switzerland with high expectations and event quality. I know that it's hard to exceed the expectations, but you, the Swiss organizers, teach a great job again. Thank you. On behalf of International Olympic Federation, I would like to officially thank Swiss organizers and Anthova small IOF gift to the chairman of organizing committee, Mr. Matthias Nigli. Please. Do you want to say some words? No, 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 just continue. Okay, okay, <laughs> we'll continue. So, 2022 international orienteering season is almost over. My personal congratulations to the World Cup winners of 2022, to Alex Anderson and Kasper Fosser. I would like to thank all athletes, team managers, coaches, supporting personnel, organizers, our IOF team, media and spectators. We had a great season. We all are waiting for very special world championships next year in, in Switzerland, Flims Larks. And see you then 
in 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. It was a great pleasure and an honor for us to, to have this World Cup final in Switzerland. Um, and to do that for the IOF, we are always uh, keen to organize. And it was a pleasure with all of you, all the spectators, all the volunteers, because I'm standing here, but without you, it wouldn't be possible to do that. And we are looking forward to see all the runners next year, all the spectators. Take your whole family and uh, all your uh, friends with you, because we will make an orienteering party next year in Flims Locks. And uh, we are looking forward that uh, also all the representatives of IOF will be back in Switzerland next year. So see you next year, and thank you very much. Thank you, and I promise we will be back here again.
This is the Victory Sunny for the overall World Cup orienteering season 2022. Siegerehrung, Gesamtweltcup Herren 2022. The medals and prize money are given by Leo Hanna, president of the IOF. Die Medaillen und das Preisgeld werden überreicht durch IOF Präsident Leo Haldner. In sixth place, representing Finland, Oli Oyala. In the fifth place, today's winner, and in the fifth place in the overall standing season 2022, representing Switzerland, Daniel Hoopman. In fourth place, representing Sweden, Emil Svensk. In the third place, also representing Sweden, Gustav Neumann. In the second place, also representing Sweden, Martin Rebo. But the winner for the second year in a row, he's winning the orienteering World Cup overall standings, representing Norway, Kasper Posser. There we have him, the overall World Cup winner, season 2022, Kasper Fosser. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please race for the national anthem of Norway. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Siegerehrung, Gesamtweltcup Damen 2022. The medals and prize money will be given by Leo Haldar, President of the IOF. Die Medaillen und das Preisgeld werden überreicht durch IOF Präsident Leo Haldar. In sixth place, representing Finland, Bella Harju. She's not present, but a big round of applause for Bella, European champion in Estonia earlier this year. In fifth place, also representing Finland, Marika Teini. In full place, representing Sweden, Lina Strand. In third place, representing Norway, Astrina Vienemesen. Representing Switzerland and today's winner, actually, Simona Ebersol. in the overall standings for the eighth year in a row, representing Sweden, Tove Alexandersson. Standings Women Oratory World Cup 2022. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please raise for the national anthem of Sweden.
So, in the place in the Teams World Cup 2022, with a total sum of 5,990 points, the team of Norway! The team of Switzerland! Box <laughs> the best team season 2022, the total sum of 7,763 points. The team of Sweden! <laughs> Sweden. Yeah. 